Can anybody see me? I'm not sure if this is live. Anybody there? Can everybody see me? I'm hoping this is working. This is the first time I've ever done this, so we'll see how it goes. All righty. Um, yeah, this is new for me. Hoping uh, some of you guys enjoy this. You have caught me live in Palm Springs, California. Uh, I spend a few months of the year down here every year staying with my folks. This is uh, their place. I head back to Canada in just a few days, so figured before leaving, I'd kick off 2024 by answering some questions. Uh, I solicited some from you guys on my Facebook community tab a few days ago, uh, some on Instagram yesterday, and uh, so I'll be answering those and what I see in the comments now. Uh, so let's kick it off. Uh, someone just asked what my uh, favorite uh, golf destinations would be outside of North America. Uh, I'll be honest and say that I feel really blessed to be on the West Coast of North America. And given that I play a lot of golf and it's my job, I need to keep it somewhat affordable. So truth be told, I'm going to play, continue to play most of my golf in North America. Uh, I have desire to do an Ireland trip for some amount of time. Um, also, New Zealand. That's probably the most exotic place I'd like to get away to golf. Uh, I know there's some world-class courses there, so I've been trying to do that. All right, I'm going to jump in as I see them. Have I played Indian Canyon South? Uh, I did. That's just around the corner for me in Palm Springs. Played it a couple times this year and uh, have a couple videos coming out there. Uh, next question here is, is golf sidekick as funny and crazy in real life as he is in his videos? So uh, I guess I should like start by saying that my channel probably wouldn't uh, exist or certainly in the form it does now if it weren't for uh, the in chief himself sharing one of my early videos. So I'm hugely grateful to him for that. And I'm happy to say that in person, he is a ball. Uh, it's actually funny. He's almost uh, he's kind of shy and reserved a bit in person until, uh, until he warms up to you. So the version of him you get on videos is sort of this immediately uh, kind of sarcastic, dry humor in your face guy. In person, that comes out, but it takes about half an hour. Uh, but total gem of a human, uh, has been like a great friend and mentor to me since starting the channel. So great guy. Uh, okay. Uh, I'm going to answer some questions about putting and short game and practice because a lot of the questions I'm seeing now and a lot of the ones uh, that I've received have been about that. So, hmm. I think the most important thing to say, like, I think people ask a lot about and they're curious, like, what are my drills? Uh, I'll be honest and say that it's been years since I've like regularly done any particular putting drill. Uh, when I was doing that, I had a practice mat that I uh, would putt on probably an hour a night for about a year. But I think, you know, that part of the putting stroke is focusing on the putting stroke, which is obviously important, right? You need to be able to get the ball started on your intended line. But I think, you know, the most important two skills as far as I'm concerned in putting are green reading and speed control. And those are things that aren't super, super technical in terms of like, you know, you know, refining your putting stroke. So when it comes to green reading, uh, I did a video that you guys can queue up on Golf Sidekick's panel about green reading. Um, it's kind of too much to go through here. But when I think about putting, most of what I'm thinking about is uh, getting a feel for the read of my putt, especially long lag putts. And that's something that, again, it, it is a process. It's like I can say, oh, do this drill to be a good green reader. Uh, I would say I practice it a lot. I read about it a lot. Uh, my guru for that is Dave Pels. Uh, but then separate from just the technical aspect of green reading, I think um, the reason I feel like I'm a pretty decent putter and it's why I am closer to being a scratch golfer than not a scratch golfer uh, just has to do with mindset on the greens and really golf generally. Uh, we'll talk more about that because we're going to talk about goldfish memory and such. But for that, uh, the guru, if I could recommend anything, it is to read uh, Bob Rotella. Golf is not a game of perfect is sort of the Bible. There's a few more of his. Uh, I know it sounds silly in like advising on a physical, like a technical sport that most of what I do for practice is about uh, mindset. But that's my answer. 
Go read uh, Bob Rotella. Okay. Let's see what we got here. Did I see it? Jersey Jerry Stream? Don't know who that is. Uh, how does the mental game change from casual rounds to tournament rounds? How do you battle the nerves? Uh, good question. And I want to start by, I'll say a lot of these questions about golf. I'm not necessarily a guru. I'm not the best golfer. I do think generally, with the odd exception, my tournament play feels similar, at least psychologically to me, as uh, just any other casual round. I guess I'm filming a lot of my casual rounds, so I, I'm already sort of aware of the fact that the score matters and people are going to watch every shot. But uh, back to what I was saying earlier, I think the psychological aspect of golf is the most important. So I try to treat like every single shot as an independent event of whatever shot preceded it. And that's the same whether I'm in a casual round and I'm firing a career score or I'm in a tournament round and I'm shooting 95 because it happens. Um, I think this will kind of dovetail into uh, just my thoughts on like the psychological approach to golf generally and goldfish memory. I play a lot of golf. I, I tabulated it last year and played 170 rounds. Uh, that was recorded towards my handicaps. So There's probably another 20 in there of scrambles or whatever that didn't get recorded. So I guess I'm just hyper aware of the fact that I'm going to make birdies. I'm going to make eagles. I'm going to make doubles. I'm going to make triples. And the distribution of those round to round uh, is all over the place. So, I mean, there are plenty of rounds where I'll make two triples and I'll make four birdies. So there's just no sense. Uh, actually, I should also say like my career round, which was an even score at Pacific Dunes, I started three over through four and those were three of those holes were easy. Then I went on to shoot even par. So I feel like I just have enough perspective to know that the only reason a round needs to compound and doubles turn into more doubles and more doubles is if I stay in my head about it. Um, so there's, I really do just, it's hard to kind of describe the process of resetting before a shot, but every shot's a new challenge. I don't think about how the ball got there. I go up to my next shot and say, what are the factors at play here? And I evaluate, okay, the entirety of that shot, how would I grade myself from thought process to execution, like rate it A through F. And I don't keep this on a scorecard, but I think about it that way. And if I walk up to a shot with an F mentality, it's like I've failed the shot before I've even hit it. So it doesn't matter to me that I made a trip on the last hole. I can score an A on the planning of my next shot, like things are back on track. And I guess, like I say, I've just played enough golf to understand that um, the, usually the bad scores compound psychologically, not physically. Like the odd time I'll go out and yeah, I'll have the shanks and it's just going to be a bad round. But most of my bad rounds, uh, total cumulative bad scores, don't come from something technical that I was doing wrong all day, but it comes from putting my head down. So that's my answer to that one for you. Okay, wow, there's more questions live than I anticipated, but that's good because we'll answer these. Uh, favorite lower mainland courses? Uh, public ones, I would go Fraser View, Kings Links, Redwoods, UBC, Morgan Creek. Not necessarily in that order. Uh, have I ever played in Scotland? I played the St. Andrews Jubilee course, which was awesome. And I played Dunbar, which was one of the best golf courses I've ever played. Can I see fine? Yes. Uh, Blonder Brunette. I'm a brunette guy. Um, awesome to hear some of you have improved your lag putting. Am I playing Pebble again soon? Uh, no. I wish I had the budget to go there every weekend, but I don't. I played there for the third time a couple weeks ago. I would love to get back next year if they do this promo again where you don't have to stay there in order to play. Uh, hopefully that'll happen. Uh, are you improving and do you think you can minimize the bad shots further? Uh, this is a good question because I think a lot of questions on my YouTube videos focus on, you know, why don't you get better? Why don't you work on your swing? Your swing is so ugly. Uh, all true things. Uh, I guess it's it's bizarre to me. I enjoy being on the golf course is really the truth of this. Uh, if you've seen sort of, uh, I put a, one of my first videos was describing my background and how I got into golf and uh, golf was sort of like my, my meditative Nirvana place while I was sick. And when I say golf, I mean the golf course. So I love being on the golf course and just to be frank, I don't like being on the driving range. I like, I don't enjoy hitting golf balls at the range. So my practice comes in pitch and putt. 
and I hit. <laughs> there's a few great pitch and putts near me in Vancouver, and I play them like whenever I can. That might mean know, a few dozen times a year or more. Uh, I don't enjoy working on my swing, and I guess I'm at the point where like I feel like golf is still my nirvana. I enjoy golf whether I shoot 72 or 92. So it's just not really um, on my radar to like put in time to work on my golf swing. It's just, it's not how I enjoy golf. And I gather that puts me in the minority. I think a lot of people are chasing improvement. Um, I obviously talk on the channel about how I try to think through the game. Like that's the kind of mental preparation I enjoy doing for golf. I don't enjoy, uh, you know, watching swing positions and figuring out how to optimize my swing. I just don't enjoy it. Um, so no, <laughs> it's a bizarre answer, but I don't really desire to get better from a change my golf swing perspective. Uh, if there comes a day that I don't enjoy uh, playing the way I do, maybe that'll change, but certainly not right now. Uh, what other golf uh, personalities would I like to collab with? That you know, I don't watch a ton of YouTube golf these days. I love the uh, golf sidekick. Um, I like the Bob Does Sports guys. We actually almost linked up in Vancouver. They were out here, but we just couldn't make the timing work. Um, Mr. Short Game, I've been in touch with for a while. He's great. Uh, just love his energy. The guy's shot out of a cannon in every video. We're going to make it happen one day, Matt. Uh, I don't know when, but we will. Uh, all right. What misconceptions? Oh, it's Matt Wong. What's up? Golf Parfection. Everyone check out the channel, Golf Parfection. Channel. And he says, what misconceptions about golf YouTube would you like to clear up that you can't easily clarify in a video? Uh, great question. Uh, this is odd, but I think the biggest one is uh, it's really, really hard to edit a video, especially to narrate something and like make a cohesive narrative in the span of 10 minutes while you're narrating on top of 18 holes. It's really, really hard. As you can see, I'm a chatterbox. So to get a concise point down into 10 seconds in a video is difficult. And very often someone will chime in in the comments and say, like, you said this, but really, and then it's two paragraphs of a more, like a more complete way of saying the point. And I very often think, yeah, you're right. I just didn't have five minutes to say that in a video. Uh, the other thing is probably about... Um, people ask about whether it's difficult filming on course and whether you're cheating with the camera, things like that. Uh, I think if a lot of people sort of saw what it's like filming on course, it is, especially at this point where I've done it a lot, it's basically non-noticeable to the people around me. It's like putting my golf bag behind me when hitting a shot. Oh, and I place this tripod. The tripod is this phone on a tripod that weighs a pound. So it's not a big deal. Um, I, I try not to do it with strangers just because, especially to be candid when there's women around, a lot of women on the golf course don't necessarily want someone with a camera out there. So usually I'm filming by myself or with friends every now and then, like at Pebble the other day, I got paired with people. And uh, I was lucky when I was there, one of my playing partners and his caddy knew the channel. They were stoked. The other guy didn't mind. Uh, but I will say one of the ways to ensure that you're not uh, pissing people off on the golf course while filming is be quick about it. So I always get, sort of get a chuckle when I see a comment going, uh, yeah, you must have hit that putt eight times until it went until it went in. And I think to myself, uh, if I were doing that around people, I'm sure I would uh, not be welcome back at golf courses if I was slowing up play doing that. Uh, nor would I have the uh, respect of my playing partner. So I, I think sometimes there's misconceptions about how the golf course rolls out the red carpet for YouTubers. Maybe they do for Rick Shields. Uh, you know, the extent of my involvement with the golf courses is if I'm playing a, a course that's like out of the budget, I'll send an email in advance and say, hey, here's my YouTube channel. Do you mind if I make a video here? Can you offer me an industry rate on a green fee if I, you know, uh, get the video out to so many people? And lots of courses say yes. But other than that, I'm just playing golf. I just happen to put the camera down in addition to putting my bag down. Uh, what advice would I give to someone starting a YouTube channel? Uh, I feel unqualified to give that advice. My channel was a labor of love. Made my first video during COVID, uh, following a not a scratch or sorry, following a golf sidekick tutorial on how to do it. And uh, Play in Chief was kind enough to share my video because he liked it, and it took off. So I should say I'm not qualified to give the advice, but to the extent that I can share anything, it would be um, have something to say, right? I think 
I do see a lot of content where I sort of get the vibe that whoever's in front of the camera is really, really excited to be a YouTuber. And it almost seems narcissistic. And it's like, if you want to make content that you want people to watch, you should be really passionate about what you're making content about. Uh, and you need to have something to say. Not necessarily even your totally unique spin. Even if what you have to say is preaching conventional advice. If you're excited to share it and you feel like you have uh, something to say, say it. I would say don't get into YouTubing because you want to be a YouTuber. I would say get into YouTubing if you feel like you need a creative outlet for something you're passionate about. Um, I'll also say that all of the other, uh, I read a lot of people who are starting YouTube channels really trying to optimize around how do I make sexier thumbnails and titles? Those are optimization problems to get to once you've established that you can make decent content that anyone wants to watch. So I think a lot of people starting channels from what I see get stuck in the weeds and fail to see the forest for the trees. Like establish that there are a few thousand people willing to watch what you do before you get bogged down in optimizing content. Uh, one final piece starting a YouTube channel, and I'm violating the rule today by doing a live stream just to my webcam, uh, have good audio. Good audio is more important than good video. Invest in a good microphone. How do I feel about the golf roll ball, uh, the golf ball rollback? Hate it. Um, yeah, golf's hard enough, and it's so easy for them. And I understand that's becoming a problem, but I feel like there are better solutions than taking us amateurs who don't hit the ball far and punishing us further. Um, yeah, hate the golf ball rollback. Absolutely hate it. <laughs> uh, what have I learned about my game as it's evolved? I've learned that I have the worst backswing of any single digit handicap I've ever seen. Uh, and I've learned that I play my best golf when I take the zen-like state I get in over putting and apply it to the rest of the game. Every now and then I do that, and every now and then it produces a good score. Uh, have I tried using a push cart attachment versus a tripod? Uh, I haven't done it. Um, I like being able to get the, my tripod on the green for putt, so I don't like having it on the push cart because that would leave some angles far away. Uh, where and when am I playing next? Uh, so my schedule tends to be about eight months of the year in Vancouver, about four months in California. And when I'm, in Cal when I'm in California, I try to play almost every day. And I'm lucky there's enough uh, friends, family, interlopers, viewers down here that uh, I don't really plan so far in advance. So my next round will be whenever someone invites me to one in the next couple of days. Um, here we go. Off-season plans. Have I tried speed, tra uh, speed training? Uh, I try to not have a golf off, off season. I chase the sun to California in the winter and then spend the rest of the year in Vancouver. I purchased speed sticks. I got to admit, I haven't used them. I would like to. I did measure my driver swing speed the other day. And on a good one, it gets to 100. Usually it's hanging around like 96 to 99. I'd like it to be a bit faster. What did I do before being a full-time YouTuber? Uh, I used to work in software sales for a couple of startups. And then at Salesforce. Uh, it was a good career. It was a more lucrative career than the one I'm doing now, but I like this a lot better. Is this my job? Yes, it is. Uh, what's up, Nick Demko? Uh, do you think that the difficulty of hitting blades is over-exaggerated? I do. I know that's a controversial take. Uh, God, what blade did I hit literally yesterday? Oh, yeah, someone had like a tailor -made. Anyway, I mean... I have a garbage golf swing and I make inconsistent contact, so I need all the help I can get. But I think a lot of people think blades are th the hardest thing to hit in the world. Like, yeah, if you really want to prioritize always, you know, maintaining consistency of ball speed, you know, consistent shots, and that's important to you because you want to, you know, you're always optimizing around your score, don't play blades. For some people, like golf isn't, I mean, I'm almost in this category. It's not necessarily about putting up the best score every day. If you like the feeling of hitting a blade and you don't care that it's costing you shots, go and hit blades. I mean, I, again, I wouldn't recommend them, but if you like them, you like them. I, I, I have a very laissez-faire attitude about everything on the golf course. Uh, in my world, dress how you want to dress, play the clubs you want to play, listen to the music you want to listen to, smoke whatever you want to smoke. Maintain pace and respect the golf course are my only rules on the golf course. Um, how did I improve from that 103 ovs to four under? 
uh, one day was really bad and one day was really good. <laughs> so we talked earlier about mentality on the golf course. I think, I honestly think a proud moment was, I look back through the footage of, I think it was 106 I shot at Cantera. And I was still having a great time. Golf's hard sometimes. Uh, hello, Lower Mainlander. What's up? Uh, I haven't seen the behind the scenes of Bob Does Sports videos, but I will check them out and I will try to do the same. I'm planning a golf trip to Vancouver in 2024. Recommendations and areas to stay and courses to play. Ooh, where to stay is tough. Uh, I have an apartment there. I don't know where to stay there, to be fully honest. Although, you know what? Hotwire has good deals there on downtown hotels that I have a friend who's, who's used. Um, in terms of courses to play, uh, there's three munis in Vancouver. One of them is called Fraser View. The conditioning is middling depending on the time of year that you're there but i think for a muni layout in parkland golf course it's fantastic the best conditioned public course in the lower mainland would be morgan creek and if you want like a unique mountain golf experience in vancouver beautiful views i would check out northland have i played desert falls and palm desert i have not um okay uh sam oh what's up sam um Hopefully make it to New England soon. So just a general note about golf travel. I would like love to do more golf travel. I've never played in North America anywhere east of Alberta, Canada, which is basically you know, Idaho in the States, or I guess Montana in the States. I would love to, and I'm going to try to this year. Um, it's tough. Again, this is uh, my job, and it's expensive to travel and play golf. I kind of weasel out of it by staying with my folks here in California and down here, uh, PGA West has given me an honorary membership. So I play a ton of golf around Palm Springs without staying, paying to stay places and paying to play golf. Um, planning trips elsewhere is tough. I do want to do it, but it's, I feel bad. A lot of people say like, you know, come out here. There's some great golf. Really tough for me to do. I don't make a lot of money doing this. So <laughs> it might look differently because I play a lot of beautiful courses, but the beautiful courses I play tend to be ones on the West Coast that have extended a cheaper free green fee. And I'm usually staying with uh, family or friends. So <laughs> I'm traveling on the cheap. Haven't played to Watson uh, Springs. Best tip for traveling with golf clubs. This one's funny. Um, once upon a time, I got like a hand-me-down or a friend gave me like a hard shell case that I used. And then I put one of those sticks that protects your driver. Then I switched to a soft shell case from Amazon Basics. I think the thing was like 80 bucks. And I was still taking the heads off my woods and hybrids. And then one day I decided to uh, walk on the wild side and just throw my full golf bag into this Amazon Basics soft shell case. I've flown with that thing uh, several dozen times. Never had a problem. Don't quote me, but it's worked for me. Uh, how do I deal with bad playing partners? Great question. Um, so first, it's funny. I'll say, I think a lot of people, especially friends who are learning, are like, oh, like I don't know if I, you know, you don't want to play with me. You're a lower handicap. Firstly, I don't, like I said, there's two rules to me on a golf course. Respect the golf course and maintain pace. And I'd rather play with someone who shoots 150 and does it in four hours than play with someone who shoots 60 in four and a half hours. Um, I will say like your question of negative energy, it is the worst. Uh, it, I don't know if I have a good answer on how to deal with it. If I see someone who's bringing nothing but negativity to the course, I'll keep my distance from them. Uh, definitely biggest pet peeve on the golf course. Number one is slow play. And number two is people whose uh, anger spills over so that it's ruining other people's rounds. I will say if I ever play with someone like that, even a friend, I won't play with them again. Um, another question about, you know, am I, will I get lessons? So a good friend of mine, uh, shout out to Gordon. He's been in some of my videos. Uh, he's a teaching pro and I hesitate to say that we do. Lessons. The reason I don't do lessons is because I don't like practicing. So there's not a huge sense in getting a lesson and being told how to improve your golf swing. If you're not willing to put in the hours to work on it, I'm not, so I don't, I, I'm probably exaggerating it to an extent. Like Gordon and I will do a few lessons a year. And maybe, you know, in the lowest point of the year in Vancouver, like I'll go and, you know, hit a few hundred balls over the course of a few days working on something. 
but again, like I just say, we all enjoy the game for different reasons. I just don't have a desire at this point to, to overhaul my golf swing to get from a, you know, I'm a six to a scratch or a six to a two. It's just, I like being on the golf course more than I like the idea of, you know, scoring lower. I know it sounds crazy, but that's me. Uh, first time breaking a hundred. I started playing golf in earnest in 2016. Yeah, 2016. And I would say within maybe, I was going to say six months, might have been more, might have been less, but I was breaking 100 relatively quickly because I had a foundation of chipping and putting from playing pitch and putt my whole life. And um, yeah, so the second I was able to sort of consistently get the ball in play, I feel like I was lucky. I was breaking 100 relatively quickly. Yeah, I loved uh, Sidekick's trip uh, to cheap golf courses, too. It's tough, to be honest. I play most of my golf in Vancouver and Southern California, where I wish there were more $30 courses around. There just aren't. I would love to do something similar. There. Have I experimented with different golf balls? Uh, a little bit. Uh, so I play a lot in the cold and wet in Vancouver in the winter. And I'll be honest, at that time of year, I'm not very picky on balls. I like playing a softball. Um, for a while, though, God, I forget what I was playing before I was playing a Pro V1. Oh, I was playing a Strixon Q-Star, Z-Star, one of those two. Uh, it's weird. I don't like feeling like a golf, but I will say I started chipping and putting with the Pro V1, and I really liked the way it felt, and then I just stuck with the Pro V1. Uh, recently, I've been reading about how I should switch to an X because it's now a higher flying, higher spinning ball, which I need, so it might be switching to that. Have I had approaches from the major club manufacturers regarding sponsorships? Uh, yeah, a couple. Um, I've had lots of, I've been approached by lots of smaller companies and a couple, uh, two big companies. I shouldn't say their names cause we didn't do agreements. Uh, it's funny, right? Like on the business side of how I do this as a job, I found that golf companies, even the big ones, um, I think like I'm the, the part of the market that they can squeeze. Um, you know, I get emails from like, do you want to review our golf clubs and we'll give you golf. And the reality is like, I, my channel isn't about reviewing equipment. I'm not going to cheapen the brand and dedicate videos to reviewing equipment in exchange for equipment. So uh, it's a business, right? If I, I, I've, you know, my answer is if you want me to dedicate content to your equipment, there's going to be two things that are going to happen here. One, I get to be fully honest. And two, uh, you got to pay me. <laughs> I can't just take free golf clubs. So uh, most of my sponsors have been outside of the golf space. Um, yeah. Uh, 2016 seems so recent. You were playing full courses before that. No, I was not. Favorite putter I've ever played. Uh, the first putter I got when I started playing was a Scotty Cameron Futura 5.5. Uh, it was my putter until a couple months ago when Playa and Chief also started producing a putter. When we developed a tandem, he did the work. I did the, yeah, I like the way it looks. And I'm now using a Wataplaya 66 AF. Uh, I have the Proto, I guess. The The final version will be dropping soon. Uh, what's the worst golf-related purchase I've ever made? Uh, one time I bought a set of TaylorMade P760 irons. They turned out to be counterfeit. And when I reviewed the way the purchase, ha uh, the way the purchase happened, the guy knowingly scammed me. Screw that guy. I hope he never makes a dirty again in the rest of his life. Uh, do a trip to the California central coast. I've been trying to do that for a while. I was actually going to do it last week, believe it or not. And then plans changed. But I talked a bit earlier about my willingness and ability to do golf trips. Uh, there will be a lot more in California. Um, <laughs> Gordon got triggered by other Gordon. That's fine. Are there any other new formats I'm excited to try in 2024? Uh, I'd be curious for you guys to tell me. I told you that like, I started my YouTube channel because I love golf, not because I know a lot about social media. And the most common question I get when I meet people, especially younger people, is like, why aren't you on Instagram? Why aren't you on TikTok? I don't know how to make content on those platforms. I'm, <laughs> I've learned how to make a 10-minute video telling a narrative. I don't, know how to, I don't know how to make any of my content a 10-second exciting clip. So with that caveat, if you guys have anything to recommend where I could produce content that you'd enjoy, and all yours. Any plans on playing with Milt again this year? I play with Milt probably 30, 40 times a year. He's a fucking gem, that guy. Uh, unfortunately, we play most of it at my home club, Shaughnessy. 
And I played, I tabulated this. I played 120 some odd courses on the channel. The only golf course ever that has said, you can't film here. It's Shaughnessy in Vancouver. And Milt and I are members there. So we play most of our golf there. So unfortunately, Milt won't be on video for a little while. Probably not till next winter when he's back in California and we overlap here. Am I going to the Amex at PGA West? 50-50. Uh, I'm flying back to Vancouver in four days to renew my passport. If it gets done in time, I will be down for the Amex. Ever thought of coming to the Midwest? Arcadia Bluffs. Arcadia Bluffs has been on my list. Uh, I talked earlier about just my ability to uh, get out and travel and stuff. Bandon or Pebble? That's my favorite question so far. Um, if I have, if I had a week to play golf, the answer would be Bandon. If I had two days to play golf, my answer is Pebble because I go and play Pebble and Spyglass. Maybe a few others though. Then you play Poppy Hills, you play Posse Tiempo. I'll say it this way. Uh, the Monterey Peninsula is my favorite place in the world, like really in the world. If there wasn't a golf course there, I would still go there every year. So for that reason, Pebble is special in my heart, but better collection of golf courses probably. Uh, wow, there's a lot of questions here. <laughs> Did I see the guy who played 500 rounds in a year? I, you know, uh, the year after my surgery, I played uh, 245 recorded rounds towards my handicap. And when someone said to me, you should look into what the world record is, I did. And I saw it was that and realized I wasn't close. Uh, any hole-in-ones, if not longest hole out? I have not made a hole-in-one, uh, except for pitch and putt, where I've made, I think, three or four. Uh, longest hole out? Actually, this is a good story. It was the first tournament I ever played in. It was in late 2016. I was like a 20 handicap. My dad, I was playing in a member guest. My dad was the member. I was the guest at a course room. Oh, at O'Donnell in Palm Springs, which has been on the channel. And the first hole of the day we played was like a 320 yard R4, ninth hole at O'Donnell. And we had, my dad hit a, a drive with his three iron. We had 120 in and I hold out for a two, but we got two pops on that hole. So it was a two net zero. And we went on to win that tournament. People were very upset with us. We were snap egging. I just had a good short game. Arizona or Palm Springs? Uh, Arizona, I think, and I'm going to do a video, I think, coming up about best golf trips in the West and Southwest. I think Arizona public golf beats Palm Springs hands down. There's so much good golf in Scottsdale. Uh, Palm Springs, I like posting up and hanging out here more. Uh, it's smaller, it's more quaint. So I like Palm Springs as a trip. If I had like a week to go play golf in one place, I would choose Scottsdale over Palm Springs. Uh, how can I play around with you? This is an awesome question. Uh, we're going to do a meetup this year. We're definitely doing one in May at PGA West. Details pending. I'm hoping to even do one sooner, maybe in March. We're coordinating it together. But we're going to do an awesome meetup. Like the plan is going to be... Um, Meet up, play, I think like three or four rounds. And then if you want to, we're going to do a, a clinic with uh, the head pro at PGA West, who's super cool. I'm blanking on his name right now, but he's a nice guy. And a little putting clinic with me. So that's definitely going to happen in May. As soon as we have details, I'll share them. Uh, if pitch and putt hole ones count, then I guess I have a few. Uh, I live in Marin. Have I played in Marin? Yeah, I've played a couple of courses in Marin on the channel. Um, their names are blanking on me right now. Uh, I love Marin. Great place. Any plans on visiting DC? Honestly, not on my radar in 2024. I think if and when I do an East Coast trip, it's going to be either to the Carolinas or up in New York, New Jersey. Um, the Mill Valley Nine Holer. I'm glad to hear about that one. I didn't know about it. I, will, I love Nine Holers and Pitch and Putts. Let's do a Vancouver meetup too. That's an awesome idea, actually. I would have to find a course in Vancouver willing to kind of help out with logistics on that. I will say, uh, like in my line of work, courses and companies in America seem to just love um, just like being generous and helping out. And they get excited about cross promoting my channel, their golf course, and they just seem hospitable. Uh, in Canada, I'm finding there's a pretty, and I'm Canadian, right? I'm not sure talking to anyone other than my own. Uh, I find that I get a lot of pushback from golf courses on 
pushback isn't the right word. I've just found particularly since COVID, a lot of courses in the Vancouver area, I'll even call one out by name, uh, Northview, still making you pay for four players in advance and doing things. A lot of golf courses in Canada, in my experience, have gotten kind of arrogant post-COVID and they're not easy to coordinate with. Uh, Bob does sports collab. Uh, so Joey Coldcuts is from uh, Vancouver. And they were in Vancouver recently and we were trying to meet up. We only overlapped for a day. It didn't work. Uh, Bellingham area, I would like to play there. Okay, there's people telling me to go to DC. I do have some friends there. Maybe I could try to make it work. I mentioned earlier, it's expensive for me to travel to places where I don't have uh, friends and family to crash with. So that's the uh, biggest impediment. Walking or carting. I play better golf when I walk. I enjoy golf more than I walk. So probably my biggest uh, pain point in the Plum Springs area is we play too much car golf here. I would very much like to walk golf. How much is creating golf content with the golf playing experience for me? Not at all. Uh, I'm lucky. It's a common question, and it totally makes sense that it would seem like it would interfere. Uh, the only bad experiences I've ever had playing and filming are when it's cart path only. And we're, you know, I, this has happened a few times in Arizona when we're parking the cart 30 yards up from the fairway and I'm running to and from my ball and my partner's ball. But other than those experiences, to me, filming is literally just part of my routine, like putting down my bag behind my shot, putting my camera. Uh, I'm lucky it hasn't really ruined my golf experience at all. Favorite course at Bandon and a tee shot I still think about. Uh, it's like picking your favorite supermodel. I love every course there. Uh, it's so odd to say, but like uh, I, for a lot of people, I think Bandon Trails is the ugly redheaded stepchild. Trails, just because it subverted my expectations, might have been my favorite, to be honest. Uh, a tee shot there, I still think about. Um, on Pacific, I think it's number four, the one that runs along the ocean, beautiful par four. That was a great hole. Uh, have I played Journey at Pechanga in SoCal? I've heard this course's name a few times. I haven't. Um, wow, there's a lot coming in here. Banff Springs, how amazing was it? Banff Springs is amazing. Super awesome. One of the most beautiful settings for golf I've ever seen. Absolutely recommend it. Stanley Thompson, the course designer, also designed Capilano, a private club in West Vancouver. Um, I have that up there with the most amazing settings for golf I've ever played, right there with Banff Springs. So if you know anyone there or can ever find a way to get out, I'd recommend that too. Do I ever get hassled for having a camera? Uh, short answer, almost never. Longer answer, every now and then there'll be a grumpy old starter. It's always at a course in Arizona or California that um, they they come and badger me, are you going to slow down play? And they see I don't slow down play, they give it up. Recommendation on a push cart. I do feel qualified to answer this one. Uh, get a click here. Uh, the back shop guys at my club always say that, you know, every other push cart comes in and after a year or two it's done. Click gears last. Get a click here. Most Overrated, or sorry, underrated and under the radar California course I played. Uh, in the Palm Springs area, Eagle Falls, where I did a video with Milt. That's an awesome course. No one ever talks about it. Super beautiful. Um, I also, this might be a hot take, but Presidio in San Francisco is this really quirky, short, hilly, not great conditioned course, but it feels like a step back in time. Uh, beautiful golf course. Uh, absolutely love playing there. I would try to get out there if you're in the area. I would love to do uh, Loomis Trail on Blaine. Haven't been there yet. I'm sorry that... Uh, don't panic. You weren't able to get it to Capilano. Off Grand Golf. What's up, uh, Walker? Apparently, Presidio is the most played course on Arcos. That's probably because San Francisco is a tech hub. I am a member at Shaughnessy in Vancouver and at PGA West here in Palm Springs. They gave me an honorary membership this year. Cool. What do I like to do away from golf? Uh, not much. <laughs> Most of my life is golf these days. It's either being on a golf course or editing videos. Uh, kind of a gearhead. I'm a big uh, driving enthusiast. So I do also like uh, getting out on the racetrack when I can. Uh, I don't own a track car. I just go out there. Stanley Thompson did this other course that I haven't heard of. Um, have I played in Hawaii? Yes, a little bit on the channel. I played Wailea Gold, which is super cool. Uh, Kapalua, not the plantation, but the bay. And the two courses at Royal Canapalli. 
Walker, no, you cannot tell people what I like to do away from the golf course. Unless you meant play cards, because uh, Walker and I play some cards. Do I get burned out from golf? Uh, no, I love golf. I love golf every day. Uh, how do I continue to grind once a good score is lost? Yeah, um, good question. Like, there definitely are days, like, I can't practice what I preach 100% of the time. Like, sometimes I go out there and I'm, uh, you know, I'm 15 over through 10. It's like, okay, like, the day's kind of done. But, um, you know, I battled this big health issue. I hate to keep kind of bringing it up. But in those moments, it's often not difficult for me to say, like, how effing lucky am I to be here right now? Like, walking on my own two feet in fresh air, walking on green grass. Uh, like I didn't expect to live this long. I thought my health issue was going to take my life. So um, I basically say to myself, why let four additional whacks of a golf ball over two hours through in my day? Usually that gets me out of feeling pissed off every now and then it doesn't. I guess I also do have a, um, a mentality of sometimes trying to flip nines. Like I will use it as motivation if I'm 10 over through nine and say like, um, well, let's see how well I can do on the back. A 10 over front nine and an even par back nine is pretty cool. Uh, and frankly, maybe I even use the YouTube channel as motivation in my mind because I say to myself like, oh, like I love these videos when I'm able to turn it around. So like I, I harnessed that the other day at uh, Poor Man's Pebble. What's that course called? Pacific Grove. And was able to do exactly that. I had a, it was shanking balls on the front nine, literally shank four or five or six or seven. And I said, let's go even on the back. I think I went two over on the back, but what can you do? Uh, pickleball. Haven't played it yet. I know I should. All the rage. Do I use any golf apps on my phone? Uh, I used to use Arcos. I really loved it. Um, I stopped using it for nothing to do with Arcos, just some technical volatility. Uh, I used to use 1830s as well. Uh, stopped using that, but it's good. Uh, how did I become such a good putter? I guess I do know how to putt. I love it. I love putting. Like I, you guys have all seen my golf swing, right? Like it's so easy to make fun of my golf swing. I don't really care, but it definitely to some level has to grate on me that I'm like, Oh, I play this sport almost every day and I'm so bad. My swing is so bad. And then putting is, it's like a totally different game. It's not even a game within a game. It's a different game. And it's not about, uh, harnessing something physical and being an athlete, which I don't have in my genes. It's like a little mind puzzle that you got to figure out. And it involves all of your senses. Right? You got to take in through your feet, through your eyes. You really need to be able to, it, it's like almost creative, right? Like you have to do all these things. And I think I just relish the process so much. Um, it really starts there with like a mindset of loving it, enjoying it, and feeling confident about doing it. I think it's allowed me to get good at it. I don't think I'm the world's best putter, but I mean, Arcos will tell me like I, I putt at about a scratch or sometimes like barely into the pluses level, the only part of my game that flirts with scratch golf. Yeah, I would say it starts with loving it, feeling confident about it. I, there was a period for about a year to two where I did practice my stroke for about an hour every night. I now, when I'm over the ball, I'm never thinking about stroke. Uh, I, I spend, you know, my 30 seconds reading my putt I get over it and I just am trying to be in a Zen like state hitting my line and I seem to do it well. Uh, I wish, again, when I have more time to put a video together, I'll have a more complete answer. But do I secretly get jealous of big hitters, even though? Yes, I do. Um, not off the tee, but like every now and then I'll watch someone like, flush a seven iron from 180 yards and watch a big high push draw suspend in the air. And I say to myself, like, holy shit, I'd love to have that feeling one time hitting a shot like that. But can't always get what we want. Uh, I have not played in Minnesota. What area of my game needs the most work? Uh, my iron play, specifically long irons. Exercise for golf, yay or nay? I mean... I should exercise. I never exercise. I'm sure I'd be a better golfer if I did. What do I use to track my handicap? Um, I'm a member of uh, Golf Canada, which is the Canadian equivalent of GIN or GHIN in America. And I put my stats in hole by hole and fairway by fairway, green by green, putt by putt. So I use that. 
I also keep a really nerdy, really detailed spreadsheet of every round I've ever played. I'll share that in a video one day, but it's borderline uh, autistic. I don't draw a line on my ball for putting. And like, I'm not giving that as a prescription because basically I mentioned that I read a lot about putting. Everything I've ever read says that putting a ball on your putter, uh, putting a ball, let's try this again, putting a line on your ball, it's like almost a cheat code and I should do it. I just find that when I'm, like I'm very routine oriented with putting and if I have to get out of my routine to spend five seconds trying to line up the line perfectly, then I get on top of it and I don't like the way it looks. It screwed me up the few times I've tried to do it. I should probably adjust because I'm sure if I could get used to it, it would be good, but no, I don't do it. Uh, any advice for starting YouTube? I answered that one earlier. Ever thought of Australia or New Zealand? Yeah, I'd love to get to New Zealand. Uh, there's a few courses there that are on my bucket list. Terra Edi, that long, goofy name one I can't pronounce, and Cape Kidnappers. There's a few more. There's a few courses I'd love. Uh, I live split between Vancouver and Palm Springs. I used to live in San Francisco. So do I aim the putter on my line? So what I do, uh, I try to commit to a line. Right? Like I, Once I've read my, my putt, once I'm over the ball, I'm trying to be committed to a line. I pick, I don't want to say a spot an inch in front of the ball, but like I, I try to get a line to the line I've committed to, and then I just try to keep my head down through my stroke trying to start the ball on the intended line. Uh, what we got here. I swapped to looking at the hole. Any thoughts on doing that? Yeah, I'm. I've I've done it. Um, I've experimented with it on short putts. I felt like I was able to to do it okay. It still on the hole felt a little unnatural to me, so I didn't stick with it. But I've seen people have success with it. So if that works, cool. Am I still using the bird dog mallet? Uh, yes. Would I recommend it when Maddie releases it to the public? Yeah. Uh. I mentioned like, so I started putting or putting. I started golfing in 2016, bought one putter and almost never cheated on it. I got an Odyssey two ball for a hot second that I actually really liked, but it was too long and I was going to cut it down, but then the lie angle on it was weird. And I thought, why am I messing with the part of my game? That's good. So I got rid of the two ball. And then the only other time I've ever switched putters again was to bird dog. It's awesome. Um, I mean, it should be uh, Matt and I, I don't want to say developed it together because that gives me too much credit. He developed it with feedback from me. So, um, yeah, we developed a putter that I absolutely effing love. And to the point that uh, I gave my gamer away, the, the Scotty away. Have I tried a lab putter? Yeah, I actually was lucky a few months ago. I was on a golf trip in Bend, Oregon. And uh, the course was running slow. So my buddy and I joined up with the foursome in front of us. We played as a sixum. It turned out it was the CEO and the exec team of lab putter. Uh, and they were handing us some of their putters. We were playing with them. They're awesome. I really like them. Uh, they had a mallet one. I don't know the the model name that I really like. But yeah, uh, other than you know switching to this new bird dog one, that's the only time I've ever officially changed putters. I putt well, so a theory on putting is if you're putting well, don't miss the work with it. So probably not going to switch to anything. Favorite race track I have driven. Great question. I'll answer it instead by saying the one I want to do is Laguna Seca, and I haven't done it. And that's a crime I used to live in the Bay Area. Uh, have I done a What's in the Bag recently? Yeah, I have. Uh, you can queue it up. It was in the last month or so. Uh, I think it's called like How to Build a Bag. Uh, yeah, I did switch from a four-wood to three-wood in there. Um, what lessons did I learn from illness? Yeah, I, I touched on this earlier. I feel like I have nothing novel to say because anyone I've ever met who's had like, you know, a near death experience kind of seems to have the same thing to say about having a newfound appreciation for life. And um, yeah, I feel that every day, like every time I'm on a golf course, every single time, even if it's, you know, cold and windy and I'm miserable, which happens sometimes. I just, I feel so grateful to be there because yeah, there was a period five years ago that I never expected to be here by now. So I, the biggest lesson it, it's taught me is to just to be grateful. Life's too short to not be grateful. And it's probably why once the YouTube channel did okay, I started pursuing it because I thought life's too short to not do something you love. Um, you know, I had, I had a prior career that was reasonably successful, but I found 
I was getting into golf right towards what turned out to be the end of my sales career because of illness. But it dawned on me one day that I was making money in order to golf. So once I had an opportunity to play golf in order to make money, even if it was less money, uh, I decided to commit to that. I gave away my old putter. I did. <laughs> um, tips on maintaining good tempo. Uh, again, I, I usually steer away from stuff like this because I'm not a golf coach. I don't know anything about the golf swing. But I can tell you my own thought, which is um, – even when I'm trying to swing hard, I try to remember to myself that swinging hard doesn't mean pulling your arms down hard. Um, it means like rotating your body in sequence. So often my like my tempo thought uh, is to just activate my hips and let my arms follow. Um, Mr. Golf gains in my ear about a lab putter. Yeah, I mean, those lab putters are awesome, man. Uh, they're really expensive. But I, I did really like them. If money was an object, what's my dream golf bag? Would I change for my current gear? Um, probably not. Uh, I really like the feel of the Titleist driver I use. Um, I switched to these um, sub-70 irons because I like the way they looked. Um, I mean, maybe if money was no obstacle. I like the look and feel of Miras. So if they made something that was uh, you know, super good for me, maybe I'd have some Mira irons. But I simultaneously am and am not a club hoe, as they say. Like, I do like looking at clubs that I like to look at, and I do switch gear, gear around. But, like, I'm under no delusion that you can buy a golf game with gear. So I definitely don't, like, sit up and be like, what if I could have any golf club would I have? Uh, how easy or hard is it to succeed as a YouTube golfer? Uh, I have survivorship bias. It's hard to answer. Um, I'll say that... Um, you know, my experience, like I, I don't make a lot of money. I, ma I make way more money than I ever thought I could make making videos about golf, but uh, I'm not getting rich doing this. <laughs> um, the hardest part, um, you know, other than adjusting to not making a ton of money is uh, it's hard to continue to make videos. Like it's, it's really hard to, to wake up and find the motivation and, and, you know, think of like, what can I say that's compelling my biggest criticism of my own channel is that I feel like I, I'm very repetitive. Uh, it's it's really hard to come up with novel content. And I'm lucky that I know every video is going to be about golf. So like, I think people starting YouTube channels generally, it's, it's, it's not hard to make one or two or three videos. It's hard to maintain, you know, one a week or two a week. It's hard. What was it like being in Tropic Thunder? Yes, I do get told I look like that still or sometimes. Does my battery stay charged? Yeah. Uh, I used to always bring an extra battery pack. I do. I put my phone on airplane mode while filming. And even if I'm filming two people during a round, the battery usually lasts. Uh, do I do any sort of exercise or gym? No. Uh, Court, Coach Gordon, uh, that's what he beats me up with most. Where would I recommend getting fitted for a putter? If you live in Vancouver, Morgan Creek has a putting studio that's fabulous. Um, uh, apart from there, I don't know. Do those come in hickory shafts? That's funny. Would I go for some super expensive Hanma bees just for fun? Probably not. Uh, I don't love the Hanma. Actually, I shouldn't say that. I'm playing a Hanma three wood right now. Um, they they made this like really big headed three wood that I like, but no, I, I don't like the gold. So. Um, any golf course Karen experiences? People that piss me off. Uh, yeah, few. Like, I feel pretty lucky to have not run into too much crazy crap. Uh. Uh, one golf course, Karen at Shaughnessy. Uh, she sucked. I can't name her. Uh, that's the only one I can think of. How do I choose my playing partners? Uh, I play a lot of golf, so I feel like I've made a lot of friends on course. And yeah. Uh, do I play with subscribers? All the time. Uh, yeah, like I get messages. Uh, I'm info at notascratchgolf.com. So I get tons of emails from people when they're in Vancouver or the Bay Area or Palm Springs. And whenever I can make a meet up with the subscriber work I do, I do it all the time. Um, taking a big hitter that doesn't score well and, and uh, caddy for them as an idea. I've been trying to do that for a while. I, 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 have, I will do that this year. You have a commitment. Have I tried an auto flex? Yes. Um, they are super cool. Uh, they, yeah. <laughs> I, the first time I hit one, I was shocked. Uh, my trajectory went up quite a bit, hit the ball farther. I've been reading lately that they there's now some other companies making similar uh, shafts for a bit less money than those autoflex costs. Um, 
something to experiment with the next time I go and actually get fitted for a for a driver, maybe. <laughs> Nick, you volunteer to be the big hitter. If you're in Vancouver or Palm Springs, let me know. Uh, do I want to play UBC soon? Yes. Send me an email, info and not a scratch golfer. Uh, dot com. What's the largest thing that surprised me after making content about the business or as a fan? Uh, you know what? The biggest surprise in a very positive way has been there's like so little hate. Like uh, my background before making like YouTube content in terms of putting any golf content online, I, I'm a big Redditor. So I used to upload some things to Reddit. People were so hostile. I'm always pleased. Like people on YouTube seem to be super nice. Like I would say it's exceedingly rare that I have to like delete a comment for saying something harassing, like exceedingly rare, like maybe once a month, maybe. Um, so that's been like the most pleasant surprise that people are just seem to be supportive. Um, another thing is that it's really tough as a creator to know when a video is going to be popular or not. Like, uh, I, I'll, my most viewed video ever, um, it's filmed at Marine Drive in Vancouver. I play a lot of golf. Like right now I probably have five or six dozen videos unedited, like waiting to get, you know, edited and narrated. And that the video footage of what's now my most viewed round ever sat on my hard drive for like a year. Cause I just remember not really thinking I had much interesting to say about that round. And then one day I thought, God, like you got to publish this video. So I did. And it was, I finished it. And I thought, eh, like I'm almost a bit embarrassed to publish that one. I don't think it was my best. And it was my most viewed video ever. So what people will like and what the YouTube algorithm will promote is another big surprise. Uh, what ball am I playing? A Pro V1. How often am I in Palm Springs? Usually a lot between December and March. What was the best holiday I've been on, both golf and non-golf related? Uh, it's the same answer every time I go to the Monterey Peninsula. It's the best trip of my life. It's my favorite place in the world, even if there weren't golf there. Have I played in Jupiter? No. Uh, haven't played out east at all. Any trading aids I use regularly? Nope. Uh, Reddit is crazy hostile. Yeah, it is. But I, I still love it. What are my thoughts on Golf Town? I freaking hate Golf Town. Um, never buy anything at full price at Golf Town would be my advice. There's always a sale and they make you jump through hoops every week. You got to monitor it. Unfortunately, it's the best we have. Would I ever do a par three course video, uh, Matthew Goodman? I've done, I've done quite a few. Um, yeah, if you like search on my channel for Stanley Park, Queen Elizabeth Park, uh, titles like How to Score Inside 100 Yards. Uh, so as an example, your swing is hideous. Your hat is boring and your eyebrows aren't even. So like that would be, someone just commented that, Pete Borchers, uh, F you. And so that's the kind of comment that I say like, I don't mind when someone comments on a video like, oh, your swing is so ugly. But when someone is just like full on hostile, that's the kind of uh, one I would remove. My dream foursome would be uh, Mo Norman. Uh, Mo Norman to me is like, he's the opposite of me, but he's the epitome of what I try to embody in terms of swinging my swing and not caring what anyone else thinks about it. The difference is his. <laughs> um, but really interesting cat, Mo Norman. Uh, I'd throw my dad in there and I'd probably throw a tiger in there. Um, What's the best bang for your buck course in Palm Springs? Uh, if you play Indian Canyon North at twilight, you always still finish and it's 55 bucks. So that would be my answer. Uh, have I ever played the Sunshine Coast? Uh, no, I've played the course on Bowen Island. It was super cool, uh, but nowhere on the Sunshine Coast. Have I played in Chilliwack and Eastern Valley area? Yeah, I played the Falls a couple of years ago. It was in terrible shape unfortunately i played sandpiper which is super cool am i familiar with the chasing scratch podcast i feel like i've seen it once or twice but i i don't remember it well now um chris uh wow i can't pronounce your last name and housen yeah feel free to send me an email man info at not a .com. what average course distance do you prefer that's a, a good question i i like this one um I tend to go by rating and slope of a course more than yardage because like it can be really deceiving. But with that said, I also kind of have like a max. Like I don't want to play a course at more than like 6,800 yards. That's usually too long unless it's like 
you know, firm and above, like well above sea level. But my general rule of thumb is if the rating of the course is harder than about one harder than par, so if it's a par 72 and the rating is like 73.5 or more, I'll usually move up a box or if the slope is higher than about 140. That's kind of my limit. Um, I, I, there's a lot of comments on videos about like play this distance or play that distance. Like my answer is play whatever you want to play that day if you can keep pace. So for me, like, you know, my sweet spot is a rating that's around par slope, not higher than the mid 130s. And you've seen it on the channel. Sometimes I'll go, let's play a box forward and like see if we can go low. Or sometimes I'll say, um, yeah, like let's let's play the 6,700 yards and see how we can do. So yeah, play whatever sees you're like the point of golf is to have fun. So like if, if having fun for you means getting your butt kicked, and like sometimes for me it does. Sometimes I want like I played uh the Dyna Shore course where they used to play an LPGA major. And I said to myself, I want to play it from their distance to like see what it's like. And um the goal is to have fun. So having fun for me that day, I said to myself, I'm probably gonna shoot a bad score. I'm gonna have fun. So I had fun, I maintained pace. If you can do that, play whatever distance. Um, have I played in Wisconsin, Sand Valley? I, that's like been high on my list. Uh, Wisconsin, Michigan, Illinois. That's a trip I'd love to do. Am I going to film the Van Open this year? Definitely. Uh, have I ever played Stanford? Yeah, I've played it a few times. One of my favorite courses. In fact, last time I was there, won a little match with Walker, Texas Golfer, and won this over there. Uh, yeah, love Stanford. Um, how many balls did I lose last year? Uh, I would say I only lose a ball every few rounds. So played played 170 rounds last year, so I probably went through 60 golf balls. Uh, that's that's losing 60. You also have to retire a lot of them. So I'm sure I bought more than 60 balls last year. Uh, yeah, I love Glen Eagles. Uh, how's my health? Thanks for asking. It is great. I hope I never have to... Uh, have a recurrence of my disease. Uh, yeah, no, health is very, very well. I, I haven't played Moffitt Field, uh, Marco, but I used to live like right there. Um, but it was before I was a golfer. Uh, what do I use to film myself? Yeah, phone camera. When I started the channel and I had an old uh, Google Pixel. Uh, then I switched to an iPhone 12 Pro Max. And recently I switched to an iPhone 15 Pro. Uh, toughest course I've ever played. Uh, probably Spyglass, which is... Incidentally, I'm also going to move the angle so I'm not looking into the sun. Um, yeah, Spyglass is probably the toughest course I've ever played. It's my favorite golf course, but man, it's hard. Uh, I'm going to do, I think, another 25 minutes here. Favorite difficult shot to nail? Good question. Uh, I don't have uh, a high flop shot, so I try to, like, never hit it. Uh, every now and then, like, you have no choice, right? And I would say put on the spot to hit a high flop shot, maybe 1 in 10 I would execute to perfection. So when I do, that's nice. But maybe the other one, like, I mentioned earlier that I am envious of someone who can, like, you know, spend a ball in the air with a long iron for a long time. I don't get that feeling, but when I do, you know, have 107 yards and I'm able to get a six iron there and hit a nice mid to high trajectory draw. That feels nice. Uh, one last ball every four rounds. I think more like one in every three rounds. And also my home course, Shaughnessy in Vancouver, it's hard to lose a ball there. Would I rather play Cypress or Augusta? Great question. Uh, this may be blasphemy to some. For me, it's Cypress. I said, uh, the Monterey Peninsula is my favorite place in the world. So, you know, Augusta's super cool. I'd love to go there one day, but my favorite place in the world is the Monterey Peninsula. The best course there is Cypress Point. Easily my answer. Um, when do you retire a golf ball? So uh, my golf spy put up a really, I think it was my, my golf spy, a really interesting study showing that basically once there's a mark on a ball that's big enough to like, not just barely feel with the finger, but big enough that you run a finger over the ball and you can the mark uh that ball's gonna lose yardage lose a ton of spin so at that point uh, i'll retire a ball put it into my bag and i'll use it like pitch and putt with how did i hit the dreaded 30 to 50 bunker shot uh not well um 
30 yards, I'll still hit an explosion shot. At 50 yards, I'll try to pick it clean, whether I do it well. Back in the winter weather, do I use simulators? Yeah. Um, Nash, you guys have seen Nash on the channel. Uh, he has, well, he had until recently a really wicked indoor simulator. He and I used to play on that quite a bit. Uh, there's also a great little golf bar in Vancouver called One Under. The best one, if any of you are in the Bay Area, uh, Eagle Club is a wicked place that's like a indoor simulator spot with a bar. It's a great place. Do I feel like going from the game improvement players are to help me start a better? Uh, no. Um, yeah, I, I think I probably hit it about as crappy as I did with game improvement irons. Now the misses are slightly more punishing. Uh, I like looking at my 70 irons, though, and the cost the occasional miss hit. That's fine. Do I ever get tired of golf? Luckily, not yet. When am I playing uh, Pasa Tiempo next? I hope soon. I love that place. Uh, one of my favorite courses in the world. Um, and thankfully, they usually don't have the green feet in there because, man, they're charging a lot there. Max driving distance is a great question. Um, there's so many ways to answer this question. So the better way for me to answer it, I think, is my swing speed is 100 miles an hour. And uh, so that really optimizes out at, like, it's hard to hit a ball. I think much farther than about 260 in neutral conditions with that swing speed. And I would say that at sea level, I'm hitting them 240 to 250. Down here in Palm Springs on a firm course, like I can hit it 300, but I don't hit the ball 300 yards. I hit it. My my answer is 240, 250. It's like an average drive. Uh, if I play anywhere I want, as long as I want for free, but I only get one golf ball. <laughs> That's a great question. Uh, I don't know how to answer that one. Maybe uh, my home course, Shaughnessy, because it's hard to lose a ball there. So I, I could probably make that ball last for a while. Uh, next club I'm likely to swap out. Uh, you know what? I did it today. Um, I had a five iron in the bag. Here, this is my old PX2 five iron. And uh, Golf Avenue in Canada just had motion running and I uh, snagged a new five hybrid instead because I hit a five iron pretty poorly. Ever had adult beverages while playing? Of course. Um, do I have a go to uh, pre round putting uh, routine? A little bit. So I mentioned I don't like practice putting at home a lot anymore. But before a round, um, I'll go to a green and I, I basically, you know, depending on how long I have, but let's say I only have 10 minutes, I'll spend five minutes hitting legs and I'll try to, I'll pick, a, like I don't even use a hole necessarily. I'll pick a spot where the green meets from 40 feet and try to lag putts to a spot where it's like the idea is to stop it right at the end of the green. So I really just want to dial in. Um, you know, the green speeds that day. And then I'll spend five minutes on inside 10 feet. Both, like, I want to hear the balls going into the hole. It me with confidence. And then on 10 foot putts, I'll want to see, like, there's some courses that just generally you'll find, oh, wow, like these break less than they appear, a little more than they appear. So basically, spend 10 minutes trying to lag cuts to a spot, 10 minutes. Often, this is more like five minutes and five minutes. Um, just breaking on putts inside 10 feet. Uh, chipper. I think people should use chippers. Like, um, is it Ping? I think Ping makes one, and it's kind of like goofy overpriced. But I went and used it, and I was like, man, a lot of golfers would benefit from this. So many people struggle with those little bump and runs around the greens. And theirs was effectively a seven iron, like seven iron loftage, probably. But the club head was really heavy, and then the uh, the lie angle, like the the shaft, was very upright. So it was essentially like almost like holding a putter. That was a seven iron loft, and I was using it. I kind of hit that shot naturally with a gap wedge often, but I think a lot of golfers are using it. How long am I staying in Palm Springs? I'm leaving Monday, uh, but I'm hoping to be back before the end of the week. Pick one, Paige or Claire. I gotta be honest, I haven't, like, I've maybe seen Claire. Um, it would be hard to focus on golf with those two, I'll say that much. Uh, has Tacoma been in touch with me? They have been. Um, I forget why our conversation kind of tailed off. Um, look, I think the dirty little secret of golf clubs is that like every manufacturer makes good golf clubs. Like maybe there's some really discount brands that I haven't heard of that don't. But, like I think so much of this is marketing. 
so much of this is just like preference. I've played everything from like Mizuno Blades to, but that was silly. Uh, they were cool clubs to like super, super, super game improvement irons. I've yet to hit a club that I'm like, oh, wow, this is a poorly made golf club. So I think golf clubs are like, pick what you like to look at. Don't pick drastically outside of the category of where you should be. So like, as an example, right now, right, I'm playing these sub-70 uh, CBs. They're like probably less forgiving than a ball striker of my caliber should play, but it's not like they're friggin' blades. So like, yeah, I, I bet these are costing me some strokes. I'm not trying to make it on the PGA Tour. I like looking down on these. And, you know, they gave me, I made these some cool custom options with ferrules and these really cool grips and blah, blah, blah. And it's like, yeah, I think if if my job depended on shooting the lowest score possible, I wouldn't be playing these. Uh, maybe I lose, you know, 0.2 strokes around by using these instead of something else. I like playing with them. I mentioned earlier, like, I just like being on the golf course. So, um, yeah, play what you're comfortable with. Sorry for the audio cutting out. Can you guys let me know if you can hear me with like a, a thumbs up or a thumbs down in the comments kind of thing? Okay, thanks guys. Um, I haven't done a thrift store challenge video. I'd really like to. I've been meaning to do it. Uh, I, the other day here in Palm Springs, I went to, uh, what's it called? Golf Alley. And I wanted to do one from there. But frankly, that was an interesting place. They had some really good clubs and good prices and then some that weren't. And like the only kind of uh, old like vintage clubs they had were actually expensive. So I didn't want to do that. Uh, apparently, thanks for that, Walker, about me what's going on here okay uh questions here have slowed down a tiny bit so i'll answer a few more that have been left in uh prior days okay so there was a question about uh my pxg irons they were great performed well they were a little shovely to look at so that's why i switched from them uh the next tournament i'm playing not sure. Um, I'll definitely be playing the Van Open, Vancouver Open, which is a three-day event. That's not till August, though, so I'm hoping to maybe play before then. Uh, it's nice that they let me uh, film that tournament, uh, so I'll definitely be doing that. Um, Dream Foursome, we talked about that. 2024 goals. Um, you know, not too many that come to mind in terms of, like, handicap goals. Uh, I have I have set a goal of I want to break par in 2024. I've only done it at O'Donnell, so I'd like to do it on a course that's at least 6,000 yards. And funny story, I was out playing with a, a friend of mine the other day, and I was the other day is two days ago. I was two under on the tee of 15 uh, on a 6,600 yard, like you know, proper golf course. I doubled uh, 15, doubled 16, par 17 and 18, and shot two. Uh, goals for the channel in the next three to five years. I don't know. Uh, I'm in like I love making content. A lot of people have been asking about uh, merch. I'd love to make merch. I'll only do it if I feel the same way I do about my content. Like when I have something valuable that's cool to share, I will. I don't want to just like put my logo on a hat and sell it. So uh, I do have a few things underway. Like I'm playing with some stuff, but. Uh, you know, like the integrity of what I do on the channel and what I market, this even relates to my sponsors, right? Like I like, I do need to make money. It's a business, but like I've never put a sponsor on the channel whose product I didn't, like when I say get behind, it's not, you know, it's not my life's mission to sell you HelloFresh, but like I use HelloFresh, it's good. So I'm like, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll recommend that. So same thing goes with if and when I'll make merch. I'm not going to make anything that I don't personally think is cool that I wouldn't want to put my hands on. So uh, goals are definitely to like, yeah, start making valuable things for the golf community outside of just the content. Uh, I know that's kind of a vague answer, but that is on my radar. How do I get out of a golf slump? Um, that actually ties to a question from earlier. If I'm really slumping, that's when I'll get a lesson. 
um, because so much of golf is, you know, these tiny little minor things that you need a set of eyes on. So like Jordan over the years has really helped me when, whenever the driver and swing tweaks do, when like the driver has been going snap hooky, I'll go get a lesson. Um, what do I use to edit my videos? Uh, Final Cut Pro is the video editing software I use. Shot Tracer Pro is what I use for shot tracers. Um, everything else you'd see on screen in a video of mine, I've hacked together with like PowerPoint, Canva. I'm not a scratch video editor either. Uh, do I watch a lot of, I'm not answering that one, sorry. <laughs> um, Will I be an AZ for the waste management? Uh, I'm hoping to be. I was going to be there last year and it didn't quite work out. Um, thoughts on YouTubers ever getting in on a pro app? That would be sweet. You know, we need to do more YouTube, um, like golf meetups. I heard Good Good uh, just announced one. I haven't seen that yet. Uh, Rick Shields was planning like a YouTube tournament. Um, we all got to meet up and play. I think it's cool. Uh, would I recommend sending my best swings or my normal swings or bad swings to swing tweaks? Um, good question. I definitely, I think your normal swing, I think like whatever you think is most demonstrative of like your normal swing, uh, would be good. Do I have a team helping me? No. Uh, I hired a video editor. Like there is some budget in the channel. I hired a video editor. She was awesome. The problem was that I realized um, once I got sufficient enough to make a raw cut of my video, what I spend the vast majority of my time doing is thinking about what to say in the narration and narrating it. So that would, you know, that takes me four or five hours per video. The rest of the video takes like three hours, usually about an eight hour process. So if five hours is something that I feel like I have to do personally, it just didn't make sense to work with an editor. So it's all me. If you become a scratch golfer, will the channel end? I don't think I'm in risk of becoming a scratch golfer. Can I give early details on the meetup? What's the format? How many people? Uh, so meetup will be for sure in May, if not one sooner, but we're going to do one in May. It'll be at PGA West. They asked me, can I get a minimum of 12 guys out? And I said, I, I'm hoping we can do more. So I'm hoping we can do like 24 guys. Don't, in terms of like format, I, I know we're, the idea is we're going to play three or four rounds plus two clinics. Uh, I don't know what we'll do in terms of like, are we doing a little tournament format or this or that? Don't know that yet, but I'll let you know when I do. Any plans to play in Ontario? Um, yeah, I have some good friends in Toronto. There's some great golf there. That is a, a 2024 like travel goals. I probably won't get to all of these, but if I'm to list all of them, it's a Toronto trip, a Northeast trip, and a trip to the Carolinas. Too bad they cut the slips from the Pebble Beach tournament. They did? I didn't know that. That sucks. All right, what am I missing here? I do have a few more. Yeah, so many of these guys about places I'm going to travel to. It's like I'm I'm trying. <laughs> if uh, if the budget were bigger, I would uh, be traveling to more places than just California and British Columbia. But that's realistically where a lot of my golf is going to be. Luckily, there's uh, good golf in those places. Favorite course in Texas? Haven't played in Texas. Uh, have I been recognized in the wild, not on the golf course? Yeah, very few times though. Like I would say most of the time I'm on a golf course, someone will recognize me. Uh, away from a golf course, maybe, I was going to say 10 times, maybe a bit more, but like 10-ish times. It's always funny when it happens because on the golf course, I, you know, if a stranger's walking up to me with a smile on their face, I'm like, oh, I bet they are a channel viewer. But in public, it's, it's, it's bizarre. Like I'll be standing in a line somewhere and someone will like, They'll catch eyes staring at me and you get a little weirded out. And then they're like, you're, you have that YouTube channel. So that's been fun. How did I get linked up with Sidekick? Um, man, I, he, he made a great video that inspired me to start my channel. And his video was called How I Make My Videos. And um, God, I need to rotate this camera again. Sorry, guys. Um, which way am I going? We're going to go this way. Um, yeah, he made a video called How I Make My Videos. I did, the, he, uh, I made one. And then I DM'd him, I think on Instagram saying thank you. And the next thing I knew, we were in touch. And yeah, he's become a really good friend. And yeah, haven't paid, haven't played Beth Page Black, haven't played out East at all. Is a meetup free? Uh, no, I mean, 
we're going to obviously set it up so that everyone who comes on the trip, we're going to get discounted green fees compared to what we would normally pay at PGA West. But yeah, no, there's have to pay to play golf, unfortunately. Um, if I can magically take one skill from any pro golfer, driving approach game, short game, putting, living or dead, who and what skill? Great question. I don't watch a ton of pro golf, to be honest. Um, I mean, it's so tough to say. I mean, maybe Tiger's Iron Game. Um, yeah, I mean, Tiger's Iron Game is an easy answer. Like current Rory's driving, maybe Seve's wedge play. There's like, there's lots of answers, and I'm not, a, I'm not a good authority on that though. What's the nearest airport to PGA West? Uh, so Palm Springs. Uh, Palm Springs is the nearest, and depending on where you're coming from, it like so Palm Springs would be a 20 or 30 minute drive from there. But LAX, like Los Angeles, is two hour drive, and then there's a few other airports in in like Orange County and San Diego there. So like John Wayne Air, Airport or San Diego, but uh, Palm Springs is the closest. When are we ever getting a house or a boss? I don't understand that question. Um, what was my first video that hit big? Uh, I, was, I was lucky. It was my second video. Um, golf sidekick shared it, and lots of people watched it. Tiger's approach isn't bad. True. The Dunes course is awesome. Yeah. Uh, you know what? I, I got some more love for the Dunes course this year than I previously did. I, I really love the Pete Dye Mountain. I, like, stadium and tournament get all the attention. And, like, they're good. They're good golf courses. Um. But yeah, I really like the PGI Mountain. That's the one I'm like, I've made the most of my PGA West videos there. What percentage of my rounds are comped? Am I paying for my rounds at all? Um, good question. I, I My general rule of thumb is this. Uh, if a green fee is like 50 to 100 bucks, I usually just pay it. Um, if a green fee is more than like 150 bucks, I'll usually reach out to a course and ask if they're interested in helping out. Like, it's all, it's like less sort of, I don't want to say less professional than you'd imagine, but it's less, I, I would say like my, my relationship with golf courses other than PGA West is maybe less formal than you'd imagine. I basically just reach out and say, Hey, like, I'd love to come and make a video at your golf course. Here's my YouTube channel. Um, you know, like this is how I support myself. And if there's any way you can help out with a green fee, that makes my job more accessible. Like I wouldn't be able to do my job if I were paying for green fees all year. And most courses are uh, pretty open to that. Uh, like, you know, sometimes they want to, you know, they, they're obviously validating. They're looking at the channel and every now and then they'll say, actually, they don't really have demands. So uh, total, I would say total percentage of my rounds comped. I don't know, somewhere between half and two thirds are comped maybe. Uh, it should be Mo Norman's ball striking in terms of borrowing a skill from a pro. You are right, Lazy Dad. That's the obvious answer. Yeah, Mo Norman. Yeah, that's the answer. I think I swing like you. How would I describe my swing? Uh, my swing, my do my backswing is trash. Uh, it's a really bad move. I whip the club inside and flat really quickly. Uh, that part's really, really bad. So yeah, this really flat takeaway. Um, then I get it surprisingly on plane with a pretty good impact position. It's so funny. Like I would never boast about my golf swing. The whole point of the channel is, you know, play golf by thinking it better, not by becoming Adam Scott. But like, it, it is funny. Like I've had my swing in front of enough pros that like the most common point of feedback is like, wow, it's impressive. You get to this impact position with that backswing. So yeah, there's a good uh, impact position going on. Have I ever felt that my swing has regressed? Um, and it's been the same golf swing for a few years, I think. Has a course ever shut me down mid-round? Nope. Do I use a specific ball? We talked a bit about that earlier, a Pro V1. Single plane is the easiest method. Yeah, like, it's funny. So uh, for those who aren't familiar, Mo Norman was a Canadian golfer who was legendarily probably the best ball striker of all time. And he advocated for a single plane swing, meaning at a dress and through your swing, you try to keep your club basically on the same plane. And there's a pretty prominent instructor named Todd Graves who's taken his school of thought and now teaches it. Um, they actually did a clinic here in Palm Springs a few weeks ago. And I decided not to go because I didn't want to fill my head with things, even though I love Mo Norman. My friend went and it ruined his golf game. So I, as much as I love Mo Norman, I'm not trying to switch my swing to his anytime soon. Um, 
Are you ready to take on Golf Busters? Yeah, man. We've been in touch a bit, haven't we? Um, ooh, this is fun. Aim point. Um, I don't want to say I'm an aim point doubter. I will say I don't use aim point. Like the thing to say, uh, the aim point is a putting system that you, if you ever see a guy on the green on, uh, on tour and they're reaching out and doing this or they're, you know, um, standing on the line with their feet and feeling things, they're probably using the system called aim point. Uh, I've done an aim point clinic and I thought it was cool and I learned some stuff. Uh, I guess I, I kind of, I do kind of scoff at people who think that aim point is like this silver bullet panacea and they've solved putting. Um, I think aim point is just systematizing, uh, a method of, of green reading and like, yeah, that's good. Uh, I don't think it's the be all and end all one at the end of the day. Like they talk about it, like it's scientific sometimes at the end of the day, you're still estimating the percentage grade of the slope. Uh, there's inconsistencies. And when you hold your hand out and use fingers, so like aim points cool. And if you're having uh trouble green reading, I think it's worthwhile doing a clinic. Uh, I don't think it's, uh, worth viewing aim point as like the, the solution to putting but it's cool yeah i know i never did a video talking through the handicap system and i'm bad at editing videos that aren't course vlogs i'm a shitty video editor i would love to do that video i apologize that i haven't gotten that one out in the uk we have a lack of practice facilities versus the us we generally rely on driving ranges not to practice especially in the winter if you lived here how would you best go about practice Oh, man, I'm the wrong guy to answer because I'm not a big practice guy. Um, yeah, sorry. Don't have a good answer for you. Do I have specific swing thoughts? Uh, I'm laughing because we once did a promo for a Swing Tweaks giveaway where I said whoever does the best roast of my swing gets free lessons. And the, the one I picked as the winner was someone who said, it's like this guy's swing thought is now flail. Um, uh, I do have some swing thoughts. Like So with driver, um, I mean, this isn't really a swing thought, but it kind of is. I, I, I try to um, just like, you know, I have some spine tilt away from the ball with my driver and I try to maintain my spine angle. I, I do, When I watch it on video, I do a bad job of it, but I'm sure I would do worse if I weren't thinking about it. So I often try to maintain my spine angle, particularly with driver. Um, what do I think about going to TPI? What is TPI? I don't know what that is. Now is a good time to do a handicap video, Lazy Dad. You're right. I want to do it. I just, man, it's tough. I find when I do videos that are the equivalent of what I'm doing here, just like talking into a still camera, I find them boring, but uh, you know what? I, I'll put one out. Um, shouldn't be that hard to do. What's my opinion on old golf clubs? Um, so like driver and hybrid and wood technology has obviously gotten better, like quantifiably better, right? But even it sort of reached a pinnacle. There's now limits on how hot a face can be, but like Nonetheless, if you're, you know, if you have a driver that's like 15 years old, you should get a new one. Like you, you, you're going to gain, gain stuff with a new driver. Um, irons, I'm convinced other than, you know, hollow body speed, speed foam filled clubs, which are cool and are a thing. I don't think that tech changes much either. Um, so yeah, I don't, I don't think tech in irons has, I, I might be wrong. Who am I to, to say this stuff? But like, I was out with uh, Corey, shout out to Corey yesterday, and he had, man, they were like 10-year-old game improvement tailor-made irons. And if you guys know me, like, I don't carry long irons, but they look kind of forgiving. And I said, man, can I try hitting your four iron on the range? And I hit it on the range, and I was like, wow, that was super forgiving, super long. Like, I struck this four iron, I don't know, like 190. The club's like at least 10 years old. So, I don't know. I don't think iron technology changes much. I might be wrong. Favorite show or movie of all time? Oh man, um, I'm a. Someone asked what I like to do away from the golf course. I'm a big movie buff. Buff is a weird way to saying it. I love movies. Favorite movie of all time might be Manhattan, or it might be Doctor Strangelove or The Shining, or my guilty pleasure one is Inglorious Bastards. Uh, favorite show? I don't watch a ton of TV. Um, I do enjoy dark comedy, so BoJack Horseman might be my answer. Did I start out going by myself or playing with whoever? Uh, I got into golf. I was dating a girl in San Francisco. We used to play pitch and putt together. And then she said, why don't we go play golf, golf together? So we would go out, the two of us. And uh, yeah, we met some golf friends. That's kind of how I started going out. Our golf sidekick and I going to meet up again this year. I hope so. He came out to the States. I've been trying to 
uh, like we've been trying to coordinate me going out to Thailand, but he's been traveling so much lately that we just haven't been able to make it work. Um, but we will, I'm sure we will this year practice stroke as part of my putting routine or no. Yeah. That's an interesting question because I've seen some recent, uh, studies. I don't read the studies. I read the articles about the studies that say that, uh, there's no merit in doing the practice stroke. I don't know. Um, so my routine, I try to keep my putting routine as consistent as possible. My green reading routine is like very methodical and consistent, but I would say over, um, long lags, probably the time you would think I should be practicing stroke before hitting it. I tend not to, frankly, the only time I, I ever get the little practice stroke in there is sometimes over really little ones. I just want to make sure I'm a little loose before I activate a short stroke. So Woody Allen and Stanley Kubrick friend. Yes, I am. Thanks, Jared. Uh, I do not have kids. Uh, that's how I play so much golf. <laughs> have I always been able to keep a good attitude on the course? Yeah. I mean, I don't want to boast, right? Like I'm like, I, I have to be less even healed in real life here on video, right? Like I hit a bad shot and I let out an F, but like, you know, there's a really funny line that I take to heart. Like I'm not good enough to get angry. Like golf's hard. Like I like I, one of the stats I I track. This is another method of how I have goldfish memory. Like in my best rounds of golf ever, like rounds where I've you know broken par at O'Donnell or been even par, I'm still gonna hit like 15 bad golf shots. So it's like on a bad day, I'm gonna hit 25 bad golf shots, and it's just like I know that I can play really good golf by my own standards while hitting a bunch of shots. So yeah, I just like when like again you hit a bad shot it feels bad in your hands like you let out an f-bomb but then like it's over like keep going for your walk in the park and like i feel like i have always kind of had that mentality about it and like look like, i i've had a i had a case of the shanks last month and like don't get me wrong like when i'm on the 15th hole and i shank my sixth ball like i'm not mr jovial i'm like kind of walking you know a little bit upset but like i still don't think i've ever let it ruin my day uh Oh, the Titleist Performance Institute. Yeah, my buddy's actually going there, I think, this week. Um, yeah, I, I, I should get there one time. I, I will say, like, I really like my Titleist driver. And so I mentioned I just got this new hybrid. Um, there was this promo. I, so basically, I now have Titleist driver, three wood, three, four, and five hybrid. And I really like them. It would be cool to go out and do a full session with them. Would I rather ace a par five while playing by myself on April Fool's Day while not filming or film a hole in one on a par three? That's a great question. Um, it's actually fun because you, usually my answer would always be like, people are like, oh, you get a hole in one with no one there. Like, I don't care, man. Like I take a hole in one by myself, but having one on video for the channel would be fun. So I don't know, hard to answer. What are my best tips to break 85? I've been putting quite a lot, uh, putting in quite a lot of time to practice. And I feel like my expectations of fast results are what's getting in the way. Uh, could be hard to know without seeing, uh, your game. Like there's so many ways to break 85, right? Like I break 85, probably 90% of the time. And if someone saw a video of my swing, they would say this guy can't break 95. So it's like, the, the, I think the question to ask yourself is where are you losing strokes? Like, eight, like 86 is 14 over par. So that means you're losing, you're making 14 bogeys. Where, what are they from? Are they from putting balls out of play off the tee? Are they from poor approach play? Are they from poor chipping, poor putting? Um, this is what I used to use Arcos for. Like sometimes even your own perception of where you're losing shots is, is like your memory can be fuzzy. So like use Arcos or like write down during the round, like where the strokes are going and then just work on that part of the game. Uh, I often find for a lot of people, it's a combination of bad putting and not putting balls in play off the tee. Um, am I a scratch by now? No. Did I go to college and what for? Yes. I went to the university of British Columbia. I was a history major before I went into a software sales career and now I'm a YouTube golfer. So not a normal life path. How important is tempo? Uh, I don't know. I am not a golf pro, but I do think like when I'm trying to hit a ball hard, I think about tempo more than speed. Do I do anything occupationally outside of YouTube? Uh, not anymore. Uh, I have some other income sources. Uh, I own some property, but I, yeah, my like time working is all golfing and editing videos. Uh, when should you move back a T box? 
Um, we talked a bit about this earlier, and I, I don't want to bog people down, so I'm going to skip that one for now. Uh, tips for lag putts. Yeah. Um, man, I look forward to our meetup when I can do some of the stuff in person. It's so hard to say this stuff in a video, but I find uh, people generally don't necessarily have a great routine for reading lag putts, and they they sort of just get behind their ball and they look at a runway between them and the hole, and then they're trying to pick a line. So the biggest tip I will give is that speed is so much more important than line the second you're outside of 15 feet. So, um, right, like we're amateurs playing on greens that usually aren't running better than 10 or 11. So it's pretty rare. I mean, not not altogether impossible, but it's pretty rare that like you're going to have a 20-foot putt that's going to break more than, let's say, three feet. So if you have a 20 foot putt and you have it breaking three feet left and it's actually breaking three feet, right. But you hit it 20 feet, you still have a kick in. So I would really, really try to dial in speed a lot more than line. And as part of reading speed, get a good, like spend time, walk a 360 degree tour around your putt. And people hear this and they go, you don't have time to do this. Trust me. You do. I can play around a golf in three and a half hours reading every putt. Um, so spend time walking around your putt, figure out if it's out uphill or downhill, uh, and then uh, figure out, like dial in those speeds on those greens. Okay, what does a 20 foot downhiller feel like? What does a 20 foot uphiller feel like? I mentioned I'm doing this before the round. Um, so yeah. How much am I looking at grain? Um, so most of my golf in Vancouver is on POA where grain isn't really, uh, doesn't affect things much. So I'm probably a bad reader of grain. I only do it down here. Uh, so yeah, I'm not looking at grain a ton. If I could play golf with one person, uh, probably Mo Norman. Uh, yeah. I'd love to play around with John Daly too. We have the same ethos about you can't pull fat, so you don't need to work out. Well, I'd be coming to Florida. Unlikely this year. Like I said, my East Coast plans this year, like more like goals than plans, are Carolina, like North and South Carolina, New York, New Jersey, Toronto. Uh, how do I keep a level head after a string of annoying things pre-round? Arriving late, annoying mother-in-law, etc. <laughs> um, I try not to arrive, uh, arrive late. I don't like being too early and I don't like being too late. And I err on the side of getting there early. In terms of keeping a level head, I'll admit, uh, I used to date a girl. We're friends now, but we didn't work out as a thing. And she used to joke that whenever she and I fought, I dropped my best golf scores. I don't know. I have used it as motivation, I guess. Have I seen golf sidekick without sunglasses? Great question. Funny story. The day I, he and I were coordinating by email and we were like on the phone and we were like good buddies for a couple of months before meeting up in person. And when we met up, um, I didn't recognize him. He was not wearing his bucket hat or sunglasses. And like, I walk up to the clubhouse and he's standing there and I'm like, could that be him? And I was like, no, that's not him, but it was him. Uh, Seattle. Yeah. Sorry, uh, Matt, I definitely will be coming to Seattle too. Sorry. And see in my head, Seattle is part of Vancouver. I'll definitely be in Seattle. Um, Phoenix and Scottsdale this year, probably. Um, yeah, I was, I've been there a few times this year, uh, with Walker, Texas golfer. We got, man, we got boxed out. We were trying to film some content there and all the courses were cart path only when we were there. And I was trying to film both of us. It didn't work. Have I played El Dorado? Yeah, I did play El Dorado. Uh, great course. Um, my funny story there is that uh, I showed up as, I think I was like a seven or eight at the time. And our host was a friend of a friend and he paid for our rounds, which was super nice of him. And then we get to the first tee and he was like, same bet as always, guys. And they were like, yeah. And I forget how much money it was now, but it was a lot of money to me at the time. I think it was like 500 bucks or something. And I was like, shit, like this guy who I've never met just paid for my round of golf. I can't be the guy who now says, well, I'm not betting. And then I took all the money and I felt really bad because I played like a career round. I was like low 70s, like 73, 74. And then I was like, oh God, now these guys are going to think I'm a sandbagger. It was a whole thing. But anyway, El Dorado was a good time. Uh, tips on controlling short game distance control. Uh, I, I, I'm guessing you mean with like wedges? Um Again, I don't love steering into like stuff that where it's like I'm a, a swing coach, but I play a lot of pitch and putt. So I've just dialed in wedge numbers playing pitch and putt. Um, okay, questions are going to keep coming. So I was originally going to cut this off 10 minutes earlier, but we'll keep going here. Uh, tips on, uh, sorry, how long do I spend warming up? Like 
my ideal amount of time is like 20 minutes, like 10 on the range and 10 on the putting green. Um, does it bother me playing with a cheater? Only if I'm playing them in a match. Like I really don't care if someone I'm playing with marks their score down as a four when they made an eight. I don't care, but not if they're playing me in a match. Uh, what do I think on strokes gained? Yeah, it's cool. Uh, I should like maybe talk about it more in videos. Um, but yeah, like I used to use Arcos for this and it was so evident seeing how many strokes I gained inside a hundred yards. And it really taught me like, oh wow, like this is the part of the game I'm good at. And holy crap, I lose a lot of uh, strokes between like 130 and 180 yards. Uh, may have an into Snoqualmie Ridge. Matt, that's awesome, man. I would love to play there. I, I played uh, I played Sahali, and I still haven't released my video from there. That was super cool. I'd love to play Snoqualmie Ridge. If you wouldn't mind emailing me at info at not a scratch golfer, I'd love to set that up. Um. Okay, Stefan Schumacher uh, asking about how I decided on like the length of time of my videos. It's so funny because I totally agree with you. Like I, I, I used to love YouTube golf. Like back in the day, I used to watch, and I, I, I mean, back in the day, I was watching like golf holics. Ah, who else was I watching? I don't recall, but all of a sudden, videos turned into like an hour long of playing nine holes, and I was like, man, this sucks. And I really loved Sidekicks format. But the first video I ever made, I was using Shot Tracer, the software that does the line behind the ball, and I was accidentally doing it in such a way that when it spat out a video, it was only doing the like six or eight seconds of you hitting the ball and the ball going out. So the final clip I wound up with was like seven minutes. And I looked at it and I was like, oh, wow, this is so much more digestible. So kind of happened by happenstance. And then oddly enough, like since then, my videos have lengthened a bit. I'm actually curious if you guys wouldn't mind commenting. Sometimes I find my videos that are at that 15 minute length to be too long to watch. Uh, but basically they got longer because I incorporated an on-course microphone. So now I'm able to share more things while I'm on the course. But basically the length of them has crept up from like eight to about 15 minutes. Uh, I have not played Pumpkin Ridge. I did a couple of trips. I did a trip to Ben this year and I wanted to go out and play Pumpkin Ridge. I, don't, I forget how close that is or isn't to Bend. Uh, but I didn't get there. Instead, we... Oh, yeah, I think Pumpkin Ridge is closer to Bandon, maybe. Um, for pro tip, anyone who... In the Pacific Northwest, there are some fabulous golf courses in Bend, Oregon. Um, specifically, pr at Pronghorn, there's the Nicholas Public and the Fazio Private. We were lucky we muscled our way in. Not muscled, we just begged and pleaded our way in to the Fazio. That was one of the best golf courses I've ever played in my life. It was, oh, it was fabulous. And then Tethero, which is a really fun ass kicking. And then Crosswater, which was somehow the weakest link and it was still great. Um, favorite pitch and putt that isn't Stanley Park. Um, so my favorite's actually Queen E Park, uh, just because I grew up not far from there and I used to, like, that's how I started playing golf. Uh, for those outside of the Vancouver area. I didn't realize until leaving Vancouver, Vancouver's unique that it has all these little pitch and putts everywhere. And they're not in great shape. Well, uh, Ambleside and West Van is in good shape. I shouldn't say they're not in good shape. They're as in good shape as they could be for a municipal pitch and putt. And uh, yeah, they're awesome. And I grew up playing Queenie Park with my dad and then with high school friends. Like it's, I love going there. Which course vloggers do I watch? Honestly, I watch Golf Sidekick. I watch Golf Perfection. I watch not many others. Um, like, I watch Bob Does Sports, but only a bit. Like, yeah, I don't watch a ton of YouTube golf anymore. Thanks, guys, for all this feedback about video length. I, it, it's actually really useful to me. Like, sometimes people comment on videos, like, I hope you don't mind me saying, like, I don't like this or I like this in videos. I love that feedback. Like, it's really useful for me to know. So, thank you. Um. Plan any new gear in the bag in 2024? I don't think so. Like I said, I'm really ha like I love my putter now. Thanks, uh, Playa and Chief. Sorry, I'm looking away because I'm looking at my golf bag. Uh, I love those Titleist wooden hybrids. Um, these sub 70 irons are super cool. Um, they they hooked me up. Uh, I, I didn't get them for free, but they like kind of they helped me out. So um, it's possible. I mentioned earlier, like, I really like looking at them. They're probably a bit above my skill level. Like, I could see myself swapping out the irons, but, like, I have no plans to. 
Um, okay, you guys want some shorts too? That's cool. Um, yeah, I haven't played up in Truckee. Uh, I would love to. I used to spend more time in the Bay Area than I do now. Um, I know Truckee's far from there, but like I just haven't done that trip. I would love to. Um, quick tips on putting. Um, man, we've talked a bit about putting. I would say, like, again, pit, okay. What I'm going to say is because I can't distill anything in 10 seconds. Go pick up a book by Dave Pels and a book by Bob Rotella. Like light up a joint or get your favorite drink and just sit back and absorb knowledge about putting. It's like, I love doing that. And it, yeah. <laughs> uh, your best beer, eyeglass and the tournament round. Thanks, Stefan. Um, yeah, I, I have two upcoming videos at Spyglass. Uh, I'm really looking forward to them. Uh, one time I got my ass handed to me again. And then the next one was my best score yet at Spyglass. It still wasn't that great, but it did start with a really cool birdie. Uh, when am I coming to the UK? Man, I don't know. It's hard for, like I said, it's hard for me to even commit to going to Florida. So the UK is tough. I would like to get back there. I don't know, though. Uh, yeah, missed a short hitter. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the guy says, Jim says, no offense that he's my favorite channel. I forgot. I like missed a short hitter. <laughs> uh, there's a guy, Coach Gurney, who has all the Rotella books as audiobooks. Sweet. Everyone listen up to that. Lazy Dad, you have like dropped a bunch of golden nuggets of knowledge in here. Um, I expected a new Bob Does Sports video by now. Still not posted. Do you mean with me or by them? Um, God, I've skipped by a few of these. I'm going to scroll up and keep listening to a few. For now, I'm going to say we're going to go another 15 minutes, but we'll see what we can do. Uh, actually, you know what? So there was a question earlier about cheating. I want to talk about cheating for a second because I find it like this weirdly fascinating topic. Cause like, it, I'll say it this way. I'm also a card player. Um, not so much anymore. I used to play a lot of cards and you find out a lot about someone's character playing cards with them or playing golf with them. Cause you, for one thing you see like what the strength of their more, like where they are willing to bend and break rules. So I want to talk about my own willingness to break rules on a golf course. I will take a breakfast ball. Uh, I don't do it that often, to be honest, but like, I have no problem if I hit a shitty drive, especially if I haven't warmed up, I'll take a breakfast ball uh, and post a score with the breakfast, like, you know, and maybe I shouldn't do that. I don't care. And then my other rule that like my sort of standard for when I will break a rule golfing and still card a score is um, basically if there's a condition on the golf course that wouldn't exist in a tournament, I'm not going to play it. So not that this happens very often. I would say once in every 20 rounds, um, you know, you're in a, a footprint in a bunker or you're in a, an area that should clearly be marked as ground under repair. When things like that happen, I'm going to take relief. And I don't really feel that bad about it. Um, now, with that said, if I was playing a match, I would not take relief without telling my play. I would ask my playing partner like, hey, is it okay if I take relief here? And if he says, yeah, cool, then I will extend the favor. If he says, no, I prefer to do everything by the book. I'll say cool. So that's kind of my standard for rules. Um, I don't care if someone I'm playing with keeping their own score cheats, but I will say like, I've seen more bizarre cheating and accusations of cheating on YouTube and on the golf course. I find it very bizarre. Again, the funniest one I find is when someone accuses me of cheating on the channel. I just told you guys like my approach to like when I will bend or break a rule. But I love the implication that I'm cheating because I'm like, wow, if I'm cheating and still shooting 85. Uh... <laughs> oh, wow. A bunch of questions came in while I went on that rant. Okay. Uh, playing, planning on playing any of the local VGT events this year? Um, probably not till the summer. Uh, the winter VGT events, I find it's, it's a lot to spend 150 bucks to drive out into the sticks and play golf in the rain. It's not for me. But during the summer, I'll play the Vancouver Open and maybe a few others. Uh, Keith, thanks, man. Um, he said he wouldn't have started his channel without uh, mine, so I appreciate that. I haven't seen your content. I will try to remember to check you out here. How did I meet Luke from Up and Down Golf? Uh, he We met through Swing Tweaks because Swing Tweaks reached out. Well, actually, I met Steve from Swing Tweaks on a golf trip, and then we started talking. He was like, I have a golf company, and I was like, I have a golf YouTube channel, blah, blah, blah. Then he later reached out to Luke, and then all of us met up in Arizona for about a week once, which was cool. Heard mixed feelings on getting fitted. 
Yeah. Man, I, I won't go on my full fitting rant. I think fitting can be really valuable. I also think it can be certainly not a sham, but like you can't buy your way to a game and you can certainly have equipment that is very poorly suited to your game. So a fitting is valuable in terms of getting like baseline things. But I think if you're not trying to go on tour, I would not be spending $1,000 upgrading shafts. I'll say it that way. Uh, but I, I, I think, look, I think fitting is valuable. And I think a good fitter, if you tell him, hey, I just like want, like a good fitter, if you tell him what your goals are in terms of what you want from your equipment and what your budget is, a good fitter is good. Uh, there are bad fitters. Uh, have I played? I actually have never played Chambers Bay. I'm absolutely going to get there this year. I was supposed to be there two different times last year. One time it rained and we didn't go. Uh, but yeah, we'll definitely get out to Chambers. Yeah, breakfast balls are legit. You're quitting the first round and starting a new one. That's what I tell myself. Um, oh, good goods on stream. I'm not going to compete with their views. Um, yeah, the lazy dad. Yeah, the worst cheating is sandbagging. Um, yeah, sandbagging is the worst. Uh, I, I'm still newish to golf, right? I started playing in 2016. And my biggest surprise, like I'm a member of a private club. And there's a lot of like really, really well off guys there. And the amount, my biggest surprise in golf culture is the amount of cheating a, someone who has $10 million will do to win $10. That's the biggest surprise to me. Uh, I haven't played Hunter Ranch. No. Uh, Lazy Dad, dropping more knowledge. If you're getting fitted, you need to ensure the fitter is brand agnostic. Too many places will steer you. Very true. Yeah, Lazy Dad, keep dropping that knowledge. Do you keep a running list of all the invites I get from all over the world? Man, I should. It's really bad. Um, I'm really lucky. I feel like every week I get probably five, 10 different people being like, come here, like I'll host you. And I always say like, yeah, if I ever get out that way, blah, blah, blah. I should do, I should keep the same kind of spreadsheet for invites that I do for my rounds played. How am I supposed to know I'm not going to make it on tour if I don't get fitted for the perfect shaft? Exactly. What was your job before? We talked about that. Uh, do I record, record all my vlogs on my phone? Yes. With 50,000 followers, do you make any money from this channel or the main benefits? Uh, so I make like, uh, I, I don't want to say too much here, but like, I'll say it this way. The, the money I make from YouTube AdSense would not be enough to call this a full-time job. It's like not, it, it would be supplementary income for most people. But yeah, so I, I make like 70% of my income through sponsorships. Any plans for coming to PEI, Cape Breton and playing Cabot Cliffs? Uh, I would like to. It's a really far trip from Vancouver. One time I got invited there last year, it was just a two-day trip and I couldn't make it work for only two days. I would like to. That's like a life goal as opposed to a 2024 goal. Am I tempted to buy courses from all the places I play? Yeah. Uh, I, I, like, I have a rule. Whenever I play a course I like, I pick up a ball mark. And if I really, really like the course, I pick up a head cover. So my head covers are Stanford, Pasa Tiempo, Pebble Beach. Uh, actually, oh yeah, Wailea. Blah, blah, blah. Am I going to go to Thailand to play with the play in chief? Definitely. Best golf book I recommend. Undoubtedly, golf is not a game of perfect. I should actually really just start saying that every time people ask me how I maintain, you know, like goldfish memory and all that stuff, go read Golf is Not a Game of Perfect by Bob Rotella or anything else by Bob Rotella. Like, I wish every golfer like had this said to them. Like, it's so, to me, it's so much more valuable than anything else just like keep a right mindset go read bob rotella he'll teach you how to do it um did you see videos of the cabot course in saint lucia uh i haven't seen it i've just heard about it and i hear it's great and they're also um building another one out in uh british columbia in revelstoke i want to say uh have i played any links in the uk uh, yeah, I, I played the St. Andrews Jubilee course and I played Dunbar. Uh, Dunbar was one of my favorite courses I've ever played. Uh, the first two holes were weak and then the rest of the golf course was world class. Um, Cam McMaster, um, I'm sorry to hear you had a similar health issue. I hope uh, you're, what did you say here? I was starting to record golf videos. Well, I hope you're doing well, man. Uh, no, not dumb. Uh, someone said it was a Dunbarney. No, not, not Dunbarney, but just a course called Dunbar is the one I played there. If I got my handicap down to scratch, would you name, change the name to temporarily a scratch? I think it's funny. Like, uh, I'm, I'm not picking on you, but I, I often see comments of like, 
yeah, like, oh, you'll have to change the name of the channel or like, why? Like, oh, you could just do a bit of work and you could be a scratch. And it's like, maybe one of the reasons I'm not so keen on working on my game as much as like the gap between me and a scratch golfer. I'm like my handicap throughout the season vacillates between like a lo- anywhere from the low fives to like the low nines. Usually it's like a six or seven. And like, I think the distance between me and a scratch golfer is about the same as the distance between me and a 20 handicap. Like scratch golf is, it's pretty, I mean, it can be done, but it's a pretty vaunted goal. I don't think I'm ever going to get there, frankly, just because I don't want to put in the kind of work it requires. Um, yeah, I, I've said before, I like being on the golf course. Like I don't want to put in um, a thousand hours of work, which I would consider work. Like it would turn to me, trying to become a scratch golfer would turn golf into work in a way that it even doesn't feel like now, like golf still feels like play that I get paid for. So I don't want to be a scratch golfer. Well, I do, but I just don't want to do the work. <laughs> um, the quiz more often than not. At one point, the other golfers trying to claim we were cheating. Our response was we're all in the same room and you're going to complain. We got more. I have a working theory because golf is formulaic and repetitive and disciplined that golf humor is too. Wall to wall cliches and recycled material. All online golfers hit at 300 type stuff. Yep. I love dad jokes on the golf course. Um, another good book is the tournament golfers player book by Mike Booker. I'm going to add that to the list, lazy dad. Cause so far everything you've said that I've been able to verify has been good. Wow. Uh, don't panic. You're saying that St. Lucia Cabot has Cypress point vibes. I'm going to go check it out. Uh, tips for playing in the rain, uh, get good rain gloves and good grips. Um, this is a shameless plug, but it's not shameless cause they're not paying me, but there's this company out of Texas called best grips and they make these like perforated leather grips. And they're super tacky and they're even tackier in the rain. Um, so yeah, like having being able to hold your club in the rain is helpful. So good foot joy rain gloves and these best grips. I would I would say get some of those. Um every shot must have a purpose, lazy dad. Another great book. Yeah, that's like right up there with golf is not a game of perfect. Every shot must have a purpose is a great book. Yeah, um, Paul Scummy concurs. The difference between five and scratch is a lot larger than most people think. Could not agree more. Um, Cam McMaster, have I shared my thoughts on the golf ball rollback? I did earlier, but like, let's talk about it again for a sec. Um, yeah, I, I mean, like, I'm really against it. <laughs> uh, obviously, selfishly, because it's going to affect me. But when they t- like, I understand that the pro game, they're so good. And one of the ways that affects amateurs and just the golf industry in a bad way is that they need to lengthen the length of these courses so that the PGA tour guys can play them, which makes them more resource hungry, which makes them not able to play these other courses that they've played historically because they've become too short. Like I get all of the negative impacts of, of them being so much better than us. I just have to think there's a better solution than forcing all of us to hit it shorter. Like golf is a game that's enjoyed by people, particularly as they get older, like a problem for everyone in golf is as they continue to enjoy the game, they continue to lose distance as they age and hitting the, I haven't heard that point really made right. Um, in the public discourse about this, I think rolling the ball back is for all of us is really dumb. I hope they don't do like, it seems like they're doing, they they've announced that they're doing it, but, um, Oh yeah. Cam McMaster Herzl gloves rule. They do. Uh, those are wicked gloves. Uh, H I R Z or H I R Z L. Any golf shoe recommendations? Um, I use. I have two types of golf shoes: old Nike G Roche Tours that you can still buy on eBay for like fifty bucks. Super waterproof, super comfortable. G Roche Tours, they're called. And then lately, I my buddy turned me into a FootJoy convert. Um, I'm now enjoying some FootJoys. Did I get the call for the YouTube tourney? I've been in touch with like the Rick Shields team. I don't know. They keep like saying like, yeah, yeah, we'll let you know. And then they don't get back to me. Um, Utah. Uh, Gabe, thanks, man. I would love to play in Utah. I was going to go up to um, not Park City, but St. George this year, but we couldn't make it work. Uh, I would love to get there. If you want to shoot me an email, info at notascratchgolfer.com. I'd love to set it up with you. What scenarios do I find myself straying from my overall strategy? I.e. going for the green when I normally wouldn't. Um, that's a good question. I guess I'm proud to say, like, I, I don't think there's like a, cons- yeah, actually, you know what? I lied. There is something. Lately, I have been 
taking hitting too many three woods on second shots of par fives when I shouldn't. I'm not following. I, I convince myself like, oh, there's not a lot of trouble up there, and I hit a three wood and I hit it poorly. And my, I was looking through stats last night. My par five scoring average went up in 2023 compared to 2022. So that's uh, I need to stop doing that. I need to start playing that second shot on par five smarter. Um, do I own a launch monitor, and would I recommend one? I don't own one, and it's funny you say that. My same buddy who just converted me to FootJoys has a... I need to ask him what model his is because it was really small, and he said it was inexpensive, and it was the only thing I've ever done that made me interested in doing a range session when I was playing with his launch monitor the other day. Yeah, I think uh, um, I think it's worth having one. Yeah, I think they're cool. Do I think more direct-to-consumer companies will develop non-conforming clubs to aid players in distance? Interesting. Um I do. Firstly, I think direct to consumer uh, golf club uh, brands, like I wish we had more of them. I, I'm just becoming increasingly convinced and maybe I'll tease something here. I'm looking at getting into this myself. It really upsets me watching us all spend $1,500 on sets of irons when I know we don't need to. It's all marketing. Like there's there's good tech in clubs, but there's no reason we need to spend as much as we do. And uh, I think Costco entering the market is a really good development. I would love to see the cost of golf equipment come down. And I think it will. Like, I think it's, sh well, I should say it this way. I think it should, and I think it might. Uh, I don't know about them making no non-conforming clubs. I think, I, I don't know if they will. I think a, a more interesting question to me is whether we will still see, um, once they do the golf ball rollback, whether we'll still be able to buy non-conforming balls, balls of today. And I hope the answer is yes. Uh, is YouTubing my full-time job? Yes. Uh, I use the Garmin R10. Yeah, yeah, I've heard good things about that one. And is the Garmin G80 the other one? Uh, have I ever been attacked by crazy animals on the golf course? Uh, I've had a few geese run at me. And the only other thing is uh, I've played quite a few times when I've stumbled into bears, uh, which is kind of scary. Um. Sometimes I find green reading, and in that sense, putting easier at nice courses versus munis. Um, so I think the nice thing about like high-end courses is uh, green speed is more consistent green to green, and just like the conditioning. So like I can see the idea that you're going to roll better putts on higher-end places, but green reading at the end of the day is still mostly like you know topography and stuff. So I don't know if I necessarily find the topography easier to read on one course versus the other, but I agree that on higher end courses, you get more consistent roles. Gandhi said, never feel bad when taking another golfer's money. That's funny. Do I think I'll ever make it to Oklahoma? Um, unlikely soon, because like I think Texas is a place I'd like to get to, but even Texas is behind a few other places I'm going to get to, so it might be a while before Oklahoma. Um. Look at birdie golf designs for amazing irons. I will look into them. Am I ever intimidated into playing further back? Most guys have to play at least the middle tees because we're too macho. <laughs> no, I, I think I really play my own game. And like, I have no problem. Like, I'll, I'll say it this way. If I'm playing, let's say there's a course with tees at like 62 and 6,800 yards. And I'm playing in a foursome where the other three guys are going, yeah, we're playing the 68. I'll, I'll play the 68. So in that sense, I'll get bullied into it, but that's probably about my cutoff at about more than that. I'll say to the guys like, and anyone, anyone who is thinking about golf the right way, anyone who I want to play golf with, like if I say to them, like, Hey guys, like we're all going to have a more enjoyable day. If I play the 6,500 instead of the 7,200, if someone's like, no, you'll play the 7,200 with us. It's like, well, no, I won't. And not, not only that, I'm going to continue to play the tees that I would prefer to play. And I'm, we're all probably going to have a bad day if it matters to you so much which tees I play. Um, would I feel happier with a harder scoring, with a harder scoring lower an easy course if it's going lower? I don't understand the question. Sorry. Um, Twenty four goals. Um, I mentioned that I want to, um, you know, start adding value to the golf community outside of the content. So twenty four goals in include. You know, making sure that these meetups we do are cool. Um, and then personal kind of golf goals. I want to break par this year. It was really close the other day. Uh, it was really frustrating that I didn't. All right, guys. That was a solid two hours. I think we're going to wrap it up. 
Um, thank you. I had no, I had no idea how this would go because I've never done this before, and I'm shocked how many people showed up and asked uh, cool questions. Um, yeah, thanks, guys. Hope to do this again soon. We probably will.